Um, now, I will just say a few words about the structure of the events today and tomorrow, and then I'll pass it on to my colleagues who have um, co-organized this event. Um, so my colleague Teresa Kuhn, who has just become my very direct colleague in my own Department of European Studies, and Brian Burgoon, um, who comes from the Department of Political Science and has also worked with Jonathan very closely. We have one more colleague who has been involved in organizing this, um, John Grin, who is stuck in teaching. He will join us um, subsequently, so John will be with us shortly. Um, so what we wanted to do, as I said, is just have a kind of shared conversation reflecting on Jonathan's work, on his inspiration for many of us, and doing it through a series of roundtables of conversations, very open ones, that I hope you will participate in as well. So apart from those of you who are here with us in the room, we've got people following us also on Zoom. The proceedings will be recorded. So for those of you who may have to step out, um, we will be um, posting um, this, this workshop online as well. Um, I will stop here and I will give the floor to my colleague Teresa Kuhn, who will say a few words um, also about um, Jonathan's role in her own program group in her own department because she's also somebody who has worked with him very closely. Teresa. Yeah, thank you very much, Rosa. As you can all see, I'm also not the Dutch average in height, so uh, I will also just, uh, <laughs> sorry? Made for men. Indeed, yes, indeed. Um, yeah, it's really a pleasure to, it's really a pleasure to, to be here today and to introduce this, this workshop in honor of Jonathan. Um, I've met Jonathan not only as a colleague of PetGov and the central role in uh, the program group PetGov, so political economy and transnational governance, um, but also as, um, of course, ACES uh, director, which I had the pleasure to be a co-director with, and also as one of the um, founding fathers of PPLE, the bachelor program that got now some fame because the Dutch crown princess just started studying it and uh, I was uh, taking over from Jonathan a role as program uh, as um, head of studies and in all these roles I saw that Jonathan is always a very you know big institution builder uh, he has really um, been able to to create some important institutions and in, important places of intellectual exchange and um, um, education and scholarly uh, um, inspiration at UVA in different levels, so uh, at ACES as well as uh, studying for PPLE. Um, he has also been a central part um, in the Petkov Governance Group, where he sometimes was a little bit feared for his sharp criticism. Uh, which I remember when I had my first job interview, I also received some sharp criticism and. Uh, um, was then very happy to see that somehow my answers had actually convinced him and uh, because shortly afterwards Jonathan took me under his wings and has been a really important mentor throughout my career uh, at UVA. This is also something that I noticed that Jonathan has been taking many young scholars and I think um, particularly also young women under his wings at UVA and has been an important mentor and guider in that respect. Also with respect to um, collaborating, um, I think Jonathan has never really taken the advantage of his higher position that has been really uh, uh, playing on equal fields, something which I think is really um, there to be said. Um, with this, I just want to leave it at this. I think we will have many opportunities in the next day to reflect on the intellectual heritage um, heritage is maybe also a bit too much like awake but it, intellectual um, 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 contribution of Jonathan and also reflect on how this might continue in the future. Thank you very much. I'm sad but true. This is a perfect height. <laughs> What's going on? Um, I'm Brian Bergoon, and uh, I am a professor in the political science department in the political economy and transnational governance group. 
I've worked with uh, Jonathan in, in that context and, and as a close colleague within our group, and then also throughout the history of Access Europe and ACES, and I'm now a co-director of ACES together with Luisa. Um, so it's in that, that capacity that I'm standing here, but it's mainly as a, a friend and an admirer of Jonathan's uh, scholarship that uh, I think the symposium has its uh, raison d'etre. Um, and it's not a coincidence that we're meeting here as opposed to in some um, meeting room at the university, not just because it's a nice place to sit, it's a good space, but also because Jonathan, whatever happened, doesn't, didn't want to have a, a so-called Abschiedskollege, right? That's a very common uh, sort of step when one uh, reaches official retirement age and sort of pushed out the door in Dutch academia. Jonathan is against all those things, uh, and uh, indeed, in his own academic work, is you know uh, firing on all cylinders, is doing more and more interesting work. You can make the argument that he's doing even more and better work than at any other point in his uh, scholarly life. So it's a kind of an odd thing for us to have a um, sort of a send off to Jonathan. Nonetheless, this is an obvious moment for us to recognize his work, to think about and reflect on his contributions to us as a particular community here in Amsterdam. And we invited a bunch of people who have worked with Jonathan, are working with Jonathan, um, to sort of share in that conversation, as you, as you heard uh, both Teresa and, and Louisa say. Um, uh, I'm not going to say anything more about Jonathan now, because we're going to uh, be doing that in the, in the coming uh, 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 30 hours or so, uh, altogether. So I'm including tomorrow and, uh, and today. And this, you don't have to be here in the middle of the night uh, celebrating Jonathan, I assure you. Um, <laughs> But what I want to do is uh, remind you what we're doing today and, and uh, on the program. So um, today we're going to have first a keynote by uh, Frank van der Brucke, who is a, a colleague and, and friend and um, uh, sort of an important figure on, in, in his own right, of course. I'll introduce him in a moment more properly. Um, so he's going to have a keynote. Well, we will have some time for some conversation, some, some discussion. I'll take a coffee break for a half hour, and then we'll have two theme panels. They'll be separated by a brief coffee break, but one theme panel, as you've seen from the program, is on transnational experimentalist governance, and another one is on uh, political economy and political economy issues. Um, so that's a lot to try to fit in, but um, it's all very connected to the work that people, people in this room are doing on those topics, um, and then also thinking about how they rub shoulders with um, and sometimes against what Jonathan is doing and reflecting on, on their sort of common journey in that theme of, of, of scholarly inquiry. Jonathan will always have a chance to ask a question, make a comment, but um, in each of these roundtables, um, the floor will be open to whoever wants to, um, yeah, uh, criticize, claim, ask a question about whatever the topic uh, at hand may be. Okay, so uh, again, welcome. So I'm the third person to say the same thing. Welcome to you all. Um, let me now actually introduce uh, Frank van der Brucke. Frank van der Brucke is also somebody who probably needs no introduction to this group, not just because um, he's a major politician on a lot of news channels that, uh, that, that many of us watch, a major figure in European public policy making, but also because he has a, a history within our academic community uh, as a scholar and as a leader, I think, within um, the University of Amsterdam. But I do want to give you a brief, uh, uh, so very brief, uh, pricey of what uh, what Frank is uh, is doing, has been doing. Uh, Frank is now the vice premier. He's the vice prime minister and the minister of uh, health and social affairs in the the sitting government um, in Belgium, in the country of Belgium. He's in that capacity, of course, taking a very strong leadership role also in the the Belgian presidency of the the EU that's uh, approaching very very soon. Um, and Frank has been a long contributor to European public policy making and thinking as a, as a politician, as a public policy maker. Um, so in the first instance, we're here to listen to what Frank has to tell us about what he's learned, what he's doing, what he has to, uh, to, to argue about, uh, you know, the state of public policy, state of social Europe. I think his particular um, imprimatur within uh, European uh, politics. Um, so we're going to listen to him as a as a as a um, politician, but all of us know that Frank is a really unusual animal, right? He's a he's not a politician who sometimes does some academia when he's uh, out of work. Um, he's somebody who really is a, a, a scholar, uh, public servant, um, somebody who has, uh, in his academic capacity, done really pioneering important work in his own right 
thinking about the character and the future and the political and economic origins of, of social Europe, Europe uh, as a set of policies at the European level, but also nation state, welfare state uh, development. Um, some of us have worked with and are working with uh, Frank, and it's a, 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 an odd thing to occasionally have contact with Frank in his current capacity, where you want, as a scholar here at least, you want to ask Frank questions about what it's like, you know, what are you doing in the real politics and the real world? Tell me, uh, tell me rumors about the, the, the politics and future of, of, of Europe. But he wants to talk about uh, ideas. He wants to talk about how the running of the projects that we're doing, or he wants to talk about the arguments or the evidence or something like that. It's a very unusual, I think you could even say surreal quality that is the yin and yang of Frank's uh, um, identity, the, the true public servant scholar. Um, so with that, I want to welcome Frank to the podium. Frank is going to speak for 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll um, talk about his, uh, his contribution, discuss it. Uh, um, Frank will take questions uh, on those issues, and we'll try to adjourn uh, for a coffee break at 4.15. Frank. No, let me set it up for you. We should click it the other way. Yeah, but let me set it up for you. Okay, there we go. Uh, thank you so much, Brian, for your very kind and generous introduction. I hope you don't expect too much by now. Obviously, I, I was very pleased to, to receive this invitation, and I felt like I have to be here. And the reason is, as I think many of you know, that uh, Jonathan Zeibin and I have been fellow travelers for more than 20 years, since the end of the 90s already the previous century, so that's more than 20 years, that we were fellow travelers, me as a policy maker, Jonathan as an academic, Jonathan challenging me often. I remember as if it were yesterday, the invitation to go to the University of Wisconsin, because as most of you know, Jonathan was one of the best observers and also analyzers of EU governance from over the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, and then Jonathan moved to Amsterdam, and so we got closer to each other again. So, but I really remember that as if it was yesterday that the seminar in Wisconsin. I think it was 2003 or something. Um, anyway, uh, let me also say that the, the title of today's uh, symposium, Transnational Governance and European Transformation, could not be better to grasp uh, Jonathan's contribution to the academic and the policy debate on the EU as a very specific sui generis uh, polity. And when Jonathan conceived his idea of experimentalist governance, the EU was indeed living a phase of transformations after the creation of the single market and the economic and monetary union. Uh, and so what I'd like to do in this presentation is look back. It's kind of a, a bird's eye view. I, I first look back and then I look forward a little bit. So in the first part of my presentation, I look back. I look back on the EU social governance transformations, which we, we've seen. Then I say something about the impact of the pandemic very briefly. And then I say a few words about what I think uh, the future agenda should be of health. So I won't talk about social affairs. I say a few words on public health. I'm responsible both for social affairs and public health, but I'll concentrate on public health, uh, giving you a glimpse just of our preparation of the Belgian presidency of the EU in the first half of 2024. I won't say too much because we have to work in a trio, as you know, and we're discussing, uh, but just give you a few ideas. So let me start with the, uh, the first uh, part. Um, traveling back, say, to the mid-90s. Um, in the area of uh, social policy and employment policy, a policy methodology that came to be coined 
the open method of coordination, the OMC, was certainly, first of all, a response to the challenge of finding a, a combination or reconciliation between, on the one hand, the need for convergence within the monetary union that was uh, from the need for convergence, the need for coordination on the one hand, but on the other hand, respect for sovereignty in sensitive areas as employment and social policy and diversity. And I see Anton sitting there. Uh, so it was about learning from each other, respecting diversity. And so the open method of coordination on which Jonathan worked a lot and to which he contributed a lot, was first of all a response to a policy methodology problem, create architecture. Uh, but I think it's important, and this is not very new what I say here, that obviously the experimentalism in the true sense of the word within that open method of coordination also matched the fact that on the substance of social policy, we were shifting the paradigm. So we were changing the paradigm. And I will be staccato in this because many people in the room know this. So I, my whole presentation is kind of staccato running through it. Uh, but I think most people in the room know this. Uh, but nevertheless, I've kind of uh, listed it again. Uh, what happened basically in the mid 90s uh, is that we, we started to recognize that the relevant social risks on which the welfare state after the war was premised were changing. We, we, we witnessed a kind of a shift from old to what we call the new risks, like non parenthood, obsolete skills, you know, that stuff. Uh, also, and as a corollary, we thought it was necessary to, to operate a shift from a welfare state as mainly an insurer ex post. After something happens, you remedy with insurance, you pay out cash to compensate. We needed a shift to a welfare state that would invest in people's capacity, uh, their human capital, their capacity, they should be equipped, which is more kind of an example response to problems. Uh, a shift from cash systems to services, strong emphasis on, on activation, but the new welfare state so conceived, and we use that word then, the new welfare state so conceived would be a productive factor. That was mid 90s, Anton and other people started to work on this and convince politicians all over the place. And we were able, we were able, I think, to counter the neoliberal critique that had become so dominant in the 1980s, when I was still a bit younger than I am now, but we had to find in the 1980s that the neoliberal critique, we were able to, to counter that. Basically, the neoliberal critique this should be on the screen there if possible, otherwise it's difficult for you to follow. Um, basically, the, the neoliberal critique said, well, the welfare state is a cost factor. Whilst the new welfare state, as we argued, is a productive factor. Now, one of the reasons, one of the reasons that was stressed by the neoliberal critique of the welfare state and 1980s, one of the reasons why the welfare state was a cost factor and a burden was that generous insurance of risks creates moral hazards. People becoming busy, people looking for incapacity benefit systems uh, when they, they don't want to work any longer. And so moral hazards, bad use, improper use of insurance systems, was seen as a very, very important problem. And one of the reasons why a generous welfare state is the cost factor and not a productive factor, because you create an activity. Now, what I would like to add here is the following, and now it becomes maybe slightly complicated, but I think that's a true analysis. As a matter of fact, this emphasis on moral hazards, so bad use, wrong use, improper use, of benefit systems. This emphasis on moral hazard was kind of a common theme in the neoliberal critique and also the conception of the new policies and the new welfare state. But because as a matter of fact, when you say people must be activated, 
You also want to fight inactivity traps, uh, perverse effects of benefit systems. And so you, you kind of look out for moral hazards. And that's important, I think, to understand. When I look at my own practice, I've been, I was, uh, end of the 1990s, I became Minister of Social Affairs, Employment. Um, my policies were very much focused on fighting moral hazards, activation and fighting moral hazards. And as you know, I've been still working on moral hazards when I was here at the University of So I was, I was not obsessed, but still, moral hazards is an important issue. And it spans both the literature on the new welfare state and the old neoliberal critique. The neoliberal critique would say any generous insurance system creates moral hazard, and that's a problem. The new welfare state literature, literature would say, well, we need activation, so moral hazard may be a problem, but you can overcome it. And that is important. Now, um, oh, I should, yeah. Let me also say the following, and I, I will be too long, I'm afraid, but I would do injustice to Jonathan's work and also Chuck Sable's work. There's still another link between open coordination as we conceived of it 25 years ago, um, experimentalism and the new welfare states as a challenge. We are in uncharted territory, mid nineties. This is new. It's really uncharted territory. And moreover, as Chuck Sable and Jonathan have been arguing, activation policies, social investment policies, they are hindered by fragmentation of services. You need good coordination of services on the basis of guidelines for action, and you need that on a multi-level basis. And so there was a real, there was a very close match between the substance of the policy challenge and the policy methodology that was argued for by, by Jonathan, Anton, Jack Sable, and other people. Um, now, you might say, you might say that the honeymoon between the EU and the open method of coordination was over pretty soon. I won't go into the, the whole story, but clearly when in 2008, we had the banking crisis and then the Great Recession, there was a shift to much more centralized, top-down hierarchical policies with the two-pack, the six-pack, uh, the, the fiscal surveillance, so much centralization, hierarchy. Uh, obviously, as we know, European Commission became kind of the master of austerity. It's not about investment in people, it's about austerity. And the team of moral hazards became, as kind of, in a sense, upskilled to country level moral hazards. We don't want those bloody Italians and Greek people uh, ruining our economies because they don't begin. It was all about moral hazard. Now, I should say, as many people in the room know, that Jonathan, in his scholarly work on the European semester, kind of nuanced that. I think, Jonathan, you've been arguing that, nevertheless, um, the, um, let's say, experimentalism was kind of more resilient than some of the people in the academic community thought, and you've been arguing, well, if you look at the semester, European semester, it's still a search for, for, for respect for sovereignty, trying to influence, but member states also fall back against centralization. So there's a lot of the literature that Jonathan produced in, in the 2000s was about, it was getting that picture a bit more nuanced. However, I would say that Despite the fact that uh, Commissioner uh, Laszlo Andor, with people like Maurizio Pereira, Anton, myself, as a kind of a reaction within the Commission against austerity, launched the social investment package arguing we should invest, we should invest in people, that's, that's not a cost factor. Despite all the work and all the campaigning for social investment and then the so called social investment package of Laszlo Andor, I would say that basically, through austerity, the, the social investment message was lost. I think it was certainly lost in practice in Spain, Italy, 
Greece, where you saw a declining trend in, in, in public investment, also in healthcare, education, etc. So it's it's a bit more nuanced than maybe just saying everything was wrong. But certainly social investment as a driving idea was lost, despite Laszlo Anders' forward-looking initiative of the social investment package. And indeed, country level moral hazard was the very uh, important. Happily, I would say, from my perspective, um, from my perspective, um, there was a kind of a, a return, a change in the tide. Um, first of all, many people, scholars, economists, people like Paul de Graube, many others, they start to say, well, maybe the problem is not just uh, country level moral hazard. Why are we in this mess after the banking crisis? Why are we more in a mess than the US? Maybe the monetary union is just incomplete. Maybe if you have a monetary union, you need to organize your solidarity in a better way. You need insurance mechanisms. And then came the idea of the banking union, which is basically an insurance mechanism. And people like me, I see each other uh, this discussion about this. Uh, people like me started to argue, well, you need a European-wide shock absorber to support unemployment benefit systems at the national level. You need a European-wide unemployment benefit support to support, which is a European-wide insurance scheme. That's what you need. This was first a scholarly debate, but then indeed some steps were taken, like a little bit towards banking union, to complete the monetary union. And so the austerity paradigm was challenged by people saying, we need more insurance. We shouldn't be obsessed by country level moral hazard, because if you're obsessed by country level moral hazard, you're completely paralyzed. And then uh, came the Juncker Commission, uh, 2014. And Juncker, I think very explicitly, made a criticism of the, uh, the previous policies, saying that the austerity measures lacked social fairness, that the social impact of the adjustment programs in countries under the Memoranda of Understanding were, were too, too heavy, saying that competitiveness cannot be achieved through social regression. Uh, and then the, the Juncker Commission launched the Pillar of Social Rights, European Pillar of Social Rights, which was accepted as a declaration in 2017. Now, a parenthesis here, just minor parenthesis. Juncker and his commission, they did not pick up social investment in their discourse. I think basically, partly for typical political communication reasons, a new commission must have a new vocabulary, so the old vocabulary. So Andor pushed social investment, no, Juncker should push something else. Huh? Uh, this was part of the story. But I also think that on substance, indeed the pillar of social rights had a little bit different perspective than let's say the social investment idea, which was about equipping people, investing in people. The pillar of social rights returned to social policy as protection, social policy based on rights. And also, I think the pillar of social rights partly returned to the community methods, free governance, as we know. And there's some legislative successes based on the community methods, thanks to the pillar of social rights. I would not say that it replaced coordination with the community method, but it added, which I think was not a bad move. Now, here we can have a very long discussion. Anton and I have discussed this quite often. Personally, I do think that indeed in our social investment advocacy, at a certain moment before the Great Recession, we kind of lost out of sight the importance of insurance, of traditional insurance. We have only one excuse why we kind of lost out of sight, why we became also obsessed with moral hazard in national policies. The reason is that at least in Western Europe, after the beginning of the 90s, there's never been a major shock. There's never been a situation where you badly need insurance. But with the banking crisis, we had it again. 
Um, and so I myself, I started to work more again on insurance and the benefits of insurance and the fact that you should not be obsessed by moral hazard. And so my basic argument, uh, and it's not necessarily terribly original, then became that, look, we should avoid kind of scholarly uh, dichotomies. You need both social investment and social influence. You need to equip people to prevent risks from materializing, but when risks are there, you should compensate and you should you need proper insurance, both at the national and EU level. If you put that together, your ambition is to have resilient welfare states. And so a number of people, including myself, we've been using resilience as our new buzzword. And I stick to that, I should say. I'll come to that in a moment. So that's more about resilience, which is a combination of insurance, ex post when you need it, and ex ante investing in people. OK. Now, then you guys stop me with my bird's eye kind of staccato sketch of 20 years of social policy debate. Then we had the pandemic. And as a matter of fact, the EU intervened swiftly to uh, support member states' fiscal efforts, to preserve employment, to strengthen healthcare systems, to cushion also social consequences of the crisis. Uh, we did that, sure, which was not an unemployment benefit insurance proper, but nevertheless, a kind of a quasi automatic, bit, bit of quasi automatic European wide shock absorber in support of temporary un uh, unemployment schemes, extremely useful. Extremely useful. So, kind of a move in that direction. The uh, recovery and, and uh, resilience facility uh, was about investing, it's about resilience, it's about collective action. Uh, very important, I'll come to that in a moment. We finally had joint procurement and advanced purchase agreement, advanced purchase uh, agreements on medical countermeasures and vaccines after 10 years discussing it. Finally had it. So we had true collective action and solidarity. Um, and then the, the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and I think she 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 merits praise for that. She conceptualized it in, in, in a mid, mid long term view, saying we should go for a European Health Union, which basically is a set of legislative packages. So basically, it was about the health union of uh, Ursula von der Leyen is basically legislating so that uh, EMMA, the European Medicines Agency, and uh, ECDC would have a stronger mandate. Then the creation of HERA is very important, the, the uh, Health Emergency and Response Agency at EU level, pretty important. Um, then pharmaceutical legislation, then changes in the uh, cross-border threats uh, regulation. So the health of union for Ursula von der Leyen is a set of legislative packages, but I think it's simply good initiatives. Obviously, they're still waiting for results and for some texts also. Now, why was that possible? I would say analytically, as I've shown in my previous part, that already before the pandemic, in a kind of, a, I would say, a positive reaction on against austerity, and just as a reaction to what was happening during the banking crisis, uh, there was a real transformation in ongoing already in EU governance in the ideation of framework. And then you had the pandemic. And basically, I think there's three aspects that we should understand and maybe tell people. First, very evidently so, with a virus that somewhere originated in China, that's like an old risk, huh? It befalls you. It's not your behavior, at least in the short run. It befalls you. There's no individual moral hazard in the short run. There's no country level moral hazard. Italy was unlucky. Um, and so moral hazard is not at play. It's a risk that befalls you and your social systems. 
I'm not saying that the response can only be based on insurance. I, I have to say later on that healthcare is all about the combination of social investment and insurance. It's all about equipping people. I'll say that in a moment. But obviously here you have the, the nature of the crisis was such that moral hazard, no, very explicitly solidarity was on the agenda and collective action. I would even go further, and I've been making that argument in some places where I thought it was needed. Generous insurance, notably in unemployment and sickness, is a precondition to fight such a pandemic efficiently. What do you have to say to people? You have to say, you feel a little bit ill. Stay home. Don't infect your colleagues. Stay home, don't work. You can say that if you have sickness insurance that is well organized. More difficult to say if your sickness insurance is company based and the company is in trouble or is simply linked to your being in employment or in Latin America where you have a very large informal sector. You cannot say in Latin America to many, many people stay home, you have insurance. And so you, I would say, you say you'd better have an error in too much generosity and moral hazard. Okay, at such a moment, the, the collective advantage of being able to say, stay home, you have a benefit, is enormous. Same with unemployment and notably also shorter working hours and temporary unemployment. The collective benefit of having that is enormous. And so it's better to err towards too much generosity than to be too strict and obsessed by moral hazard if you have to fight a pandemic, an infection. And that is important, that's important. And I've been explaining that to people. Now, by the way, just to be sure, I'm at this very moment, again, working on moral hazard, and I'm implementing a scheme to get people on a long-term sickness benefit situation to work. There's a lot of discussion again in Belgium on that. I will persist, but in the short term, you'd better err vis a vis towards too much generosity. And that's what we did, also that's what we did. Finally, and as I already said, the EU ideational framework also had already changed with the backlash on, on austerity. And I think that explains why there was a very explicit call to collective action and um, Solidarity. Now, okay, let me now say again a bit, little bit in staccato, I apologize for that, just a few thoughts about, about this collective action. Um, I, I sound a little bit critical, but that's, I think, what you need to do. You should not be complacent. So I, I said that we've seen Europe at the worst of times with our uh, in the beginning of the pandemic with closing borders, trying to buy rapidly countermeasures against other European countries. So that, we've seen that, but then we've seen collective action. We've seen joint procurement, we've seen advanced purchase agreements. And basically, I think we can congratulate the commission and for the job done. Nevertheless, we should not be complacent. Um, I think HERA is a powerful initiative, but it's in the beginning. Still a lot of work. I think the advanced purchase agreements on vaccines have been extremely important. And uh, some joint procurement uh, uh, initiatives have been extremely important and successful. However, there's a number of lessons to be learned and I have them here. First, if you organize joint procurement or advanced purchase agreements, with advanced purchase agreements is always the case. But let, let me put it in a more generic way. If you organize a kind of joint procurement, a kind of solidarity in purchasing stuff, you must do it in an exclusive way. You cannot have countries acting bilaterally around the globe. It doesn't work. At least it undermines the efficiency of what you do. So this works if the solidarity is exclusive. If there is no possibility for member states to bilaterally negotiate on, on vaccines or other countermeasures. So it must be exclusive. You must be solidly united. 
Bull Bixman, who is not here, but he's been making that argument. I think Teresa will remember, uh, Ryan will remember. Bull is has been making that argument in a paper that we published. I'll come to that in a moment. It is absolutely true. So you cannot have a half-baked kind of joint coherence. First lesson. Second lesson is maybe not the most important for this debate, but I think it's important to have the member states as member states involved early on so that we can, as member states, we can have real impact and do, we have common thinking on what exactly do we need, what kind of flexibility you need in the contracts. We have a huge debate now because there's really insufficient flexibility with Pfizer and others. So you must be, I mean, member states are important to also to be involved rapidly and to, to see to it that what you buy is really what you need to buy and that you're not bound too much. Uh, and then my third point is, is an important one. Uh, and it's maybe my most important one at this very moment, but it's a difficult one. When we did the advanced purchase agreements of vaccines, so the AstraZeneca, the Moderna, the Pfizer, et cetera, obviously we, we badly needed to buy them. And so there, there was no what is called proper health technology assessment. Health technology assessment, or medical health technology assessment, basically in simple words, it means that you, it's not just judging whether a drug or a vaccine is safe in good quality and has an impact. That's what Emma, as a regulatory agency, judges. That's regulation, market authorization. However, health technology assessment means that you look at the comparative added value of a drug. Does it add much value to the drugs you already have? How much? quality life years you gain extra with that drug that you might not gain with another drug and what's the cost. So that comparative argument which you need when you decide on the reimbursement, that's not what Emma produces, huh? when there is market authorization. Okay. When we were in the advanced purchase agreement mode, we did not do that. We did not have health technology assessment. It's just, it's safe, it's quality, it has an impact. Okay, we buy. I think that this mode of functioning must not become the general mode of functioning and making drugs and vaccines available. Now, I'm not criticizing Emma here. Yesterday we had long discussions. I have, I have good discussions with the Emma people on this because they are a regulatory agency. So their vocation is regulation, smart authorization. But we as policymakers, we want to know something about the added value and the comparative cost efficiency of a drug before putting our money in it. Uh, and that is what you badly need. So there are some ideas on this. What can you do to, to, to combine health technology assessment with advanced purchase agreements? You could say, okay, if you need to buy rapidly, then, okay, you postpone your health technology assessment, but it will come and it might change the contract. Uh, you can give a temporary, you can do temporary stuff, etc. But that's that's an important issue. Finally, on the monkeypox, I'm running over time if I take too long, but maybe just the monkeypox was for me a bit of mixed experience at EU level, also at Belgian level, obviously. Um, here you did have a pandemic of a kind not a major threat to our health systems. It's not like COVID. Nevertheless, a true joint procurement with also exclusive buying would have been useful. That did not happen. So it was bilateral negotiation and a, a, a direct procurement at level of Europe, which is not very efficient. So I was not too satisfied, not so satisfied with the degree of coordination on monkey box. And I think that we've discussed it yesterday also at the uh, the, the EPSCO, uh, about the, the Minister of Child Council. Um, I think monkey, the monkeypox case could be an example of common stockpiling, true common stockpiling, if you do true well-organized joint procurement for something that is not a major, major pandemic, 
but still by collective action, if you organize it well, it would be useful. Okay. Then, here I have put limits to diversity. You remember diversity, very important in the 90s. We should respect diversity. However, here I will talk about limits to diversity. Uh, what, what is the issue? Um, I think the paper to keep my trend. Yeah. Um, let me first give the context. I think in the in the COVID pandemic, um, the, uh, the the scientific evidence I think was never so desperately needed. It was also scarce and, and very debated. I think it's it's fair to say that in the beginning, we national policymakers. We were a bit disappointed by the lack of scientific leadership and speak from the EU and its agencies in this matter. You may be surprised that I say that. Now I'm talking about guidelines for policy. For instance, guidelines for use of masks, guidelines for testing and tracing policies, and then guidelines for how you use the vaccines, which age cohorts, which groups, which timing. Uh, this was lacking. Emma did, for instance, obviously not come up with guidelines on the use of the vaccines because it's a regulatory agency. But when you buy a common stock stockpile, I, for one, I would also like to agree on how you use it. Why is that? Well, just I, maybe you won't remember that from a Dutch perspective, I don't know. But when we had the first Counterindications against AstraZeneca of secondary effects, I decided to carry on. I was quite alone in Europe, and I think I made the right decision. I just, I carry on. Because otherwise, our, our campaign would have been broken. Uh, but in Holland, in Germany, there was a very different decision stopping, pausing H, H limits immediately. Denmark completely stopped. Now, people watch television. It is not easy to fight vaccine hesitancy. It's not easy. But it's certainly very complicated. If I say, oh, let's use AstraZeneca like we use it, we are waiting for more evidence. Uh, whilst in Holland and Germany, they take a different option. So you must have common guidelines on how you use that stockpile. So, and this bridge is a little bit what I said about health technology assessment. You need health technology assessment when you make your decisions on what you are buying. And then you need, you cannot afford too much divergence in how you use those vaccines. Uh, and I've been making that argument. I should say, Emma, to my great pleasure, because we insisted very much, Emma did then come up with a, a cost benefit, uh, uh, an advantage benefit analysis of AstraZeneca over age cohorts, because I insisted so much. They did do that, but this was very exceptional. This goes beyond market authorization. They did not redo that for other vaccines, but that's what you need. And then you have to develop common guidelines. Now, by the way, in the paper we published with Roul and uh, I think Francesco, and I worked also with Teresa and Ali de Ruyter, who is not here. And I've been quoting that very often to my colleagues, this is my academic argument. In the survey experiment we did, Brian also is involved, in the survey experiment we did on joint procurement of method of countermeasures. If you say it's not national agencies that will decide how you use the stockpile, it's an EU agency, support rather increased than decreased. It's a nuance, but rather increased than decreased with public opinion. I've been making the FF canvas that they provide, they have sent it to the commission, to everybody involved, saying, look at this. We have to work on common guidelines on how we use the vaccines. People are not against that. We have a survey experiment. Thanks to you, to you people. Huh? And I think it's absolutely true. It makes sense. It makes sense policy-wise. It makes sense in terms of public opinion, and we can share that. Now, um, so um, I've, I've added this here. I should also say we should maybe not 
simply criticize the EU level here, because obviously the governance problem is also in the action of the member states. We first want to decide the measures and then we discuss. It should be the other way around. You first discuss at the EU level and then you implement the measures. So it's, it's, it's also a governance issue in, in the game between the EU and the, the member states. Now, and then finally, um, so there is HERA now, that's a major positive initiative. There's a, a stronger mandate coming for EMMA, for ECDC. There is the changing regulation on uh, cross-border threats. I think that's fine, but I, I would say the jury is still out. The jury is still out, whether that will really function. And whether, for instance, here I will really function. Um, Monkeypox, as I said, was not terribly enthusiastic about what we did. Um, and so it's also a question, not just a question of legislation, but also of political will and leadership that is needed in such circumstances. And if if the new legislation is not sufficient, we might have to, to rethink it, obviously. Okay, I'm still, I'm, I'm getting to the end of my introduction here. Obviously, maybe, and maybe the most painful lesson of the pandemic was to witness the limits of our healthcare systems. Um, and there is really sort of critical. They, they just survived, at least in Belgium, I think just able just to, to maintain it, just. Huh? Um, and so I think there's a number of common challenges, even if I think healthcare is, is very much and will remain national competence because it's it's interwoven with, with the legacy of also of culture of people, etc. But you have a, you have clearly very common challenges. First, we must focus on resilience rather than just focus on, let's say, the trade-off or the, 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 the combination of cost efficiency and quality here and now, which is which has been the main agenda very often. So you you must maximize your quality in your healthcare system in the most cost efficient way. Resilience adds to that. You need search capacity. You need preparedness. And, and that's an agenda per se. Uh, you need sufficient investment, obviously, to have that search capacity. Uh, you need flexibility of health professions, a sensitive issue, difficult issue, uh, linked partly with EU legislation also, because here the EU is a, is, is a legislature also. Um, you need defragmentation. I come back to something I said about Jonathan's and Chuck Sable's work. It's been the same story in a sense. Your, your criticism or your, your observation in the mid 90s was we need to defragment welfare service delivery. It's been the same story. You need defragmentation between primary care, hospital care, uh, elderly care, uh, which is easier said than done. And coming back to the idea of investing in people, obviously the general health status of the population when you are confronted with a pandemic is a factor. It is a factor. Right? And so you should care for the general health state of your population, which is a really social investment per se. Right? Ex ante, equipping people, right? uh, being resilient at the individual level. So uh, I'm here nearly at the end of my talk, I would say public health is all about social investment and insurance. There we are, happily together. It's all about social investment and insurance. And the idea that was uh, proposed by Ursula von der Leyen when she said we need a, a European health union, it should go beyond a set of legislative packages, which it has been now. You need substance to that. So that is the thinking I'm developing for the Belgian presidency of the EU first half of 2024. Um, it's, it's, it's not exactly a gift to have a presidency when you have European elections in April. <laughs> and we will have elections. However, however, if we, with together with the Spanish presidency and, and the Hungarian presidency that comes after, 
if we can kind of contribute to setting the, the agenda for the next legislature, for the next commission, it might be interesting. I would say, let's put, let's use resilience. Maybe it's not terribly original, but still there's a lot of work to be done. Let's use resilience as the overarching concept for healthcare and public health systems. So that is invest and reform. Now, just one word about resilience is a bit of philosophical observation that I think also very relevant politically. Resilience is often defined in a bit of technocratic way. It's the capacity of a system to maintain itself, to stay. Okay. I would argue resilience is about maintaining what you find valuable but you find normatively important. That's what you should maintain. So it's not just a technocratic concept. And for instance, universal access to healthcare is an absolutely important principle, which happens to be also the principle number 16 of the pillar of social rights. So you could make a link there between the pillar that still is around, that is still is part of the framework, and this kind of agenda. So I would say it's not, I don't have to invent the wheel. Resilience is more than a technocratic concept. It's maintaining what you value and what is really important, which is universal access for high quality care. I think we have to work on workforce. I think we are not done in terms of preparedness. I think we have to evaluate how HERA will do. Um, and then there's a whole agenda, but that's not here. There's a whole agenda on pharmaceuticals. I, HTA, I know I'm going much beyond just joint procurement, joint HTA asking when a, the industry, when an industry introduces a file with Emma for market authorization, we think the clinical trials should not be just what you need for market authorization. Safe quality has an impact, okay. You would need from the outset the information that allows you to make a comparative assessment. So you, you need to reach your clinical trials than what you get there from the outset. Uh, so this is, I think, the kind of agenda we should um, pursue. Okay, I'm kind of done. Um, so um, there's more to say about this, but I, I'll stop here. What I wanted to do, just uh, I, I felt kind of challenged, was to think about our common journey you know, over the last 23, 24 years, just a bird's eye view on how the thinking evolved. If it's self critical, one should be sometimes what's self critical, why you need to find the right balance. Uh, a lot of nuance uh, that you added often. Uh, but still, there's, I think, some important political fights that have been won and lost and won again. Uh, and that's politics. Um, and so, in my view, um, the pandemic. And then today, the energy crisis, they, in a sense, in all the, the turmoil we have and all the, the hardship we might have, it's also an opportunity for Europe to be the real arena of solidarity and collective action. Thank you. So if you could... Uh... If you could stay where you are, uh, uh, Frank, and take uh, take some questions and comments. We have a little less than 15 minutes. So who has a question or a comment uh, for, for Frank? I have, to, I have to let him do it. He, sorry, he's the man of honor. He I raised his- other people in mind. I'll, I'll make sure we get, we get to you. So uh, first, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> first, first a few other people and then we'll uh, go to you. Yeah, so Amy Verdun. This is Amy, Amy Verdun. Yeah, thank you so, very much. Yeah. It was very stimulating talk. Clever to have to jump into the agenda, reintroduce the word talk, and then set back to us. So, well done on that. I, one of the things that Jonathan would always uh, ask us is about sort of interaction between uh, technocratic and democratic. And what can the, the services that the EU can provide, what can it do for the people? And a lot of this work engaged with sort of policymakers and the actors in the system. And as you were sharing with us your view on the European Health Union, it, it seems to kind of bring those things together. So the, 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 this service, this, this investment, could also be a way to bring the EU closer to the citizen 
And to all those who feel that the EU has not been a sufficiently social democratic project. And so it's sort of all over your presentation, but you, you're, you haven't yet kind of addressed it head on. So I was wondering if we could ask you to bring those threads together to then think about what do youth need, the people who are disenfranchised, the, the, the precarious, but also all those scholars who've worried so much about the EU being mostly market and insufficient state. In other words, focusing on business and, and the creation of a space where a lot can happen, but those who worry about our social welfare being uh, sort of undressed and become uh, too much market. So just to invite you to bring those things together and share your views on it. Thank you. First colleague, some questions? No. Let's, uh, we'll do it two at a time. Yes. Is that okay? So uh, in the order that I saw people, so um, Anton Emmerich there in the back. Yeah, Frank, I have a question on in the middle of your talk, you seem to be saying it's, it's actually good to have a little bit of access more or have a hazard opportunity when a crisis goes really deep. And I wonder how would you call that if you have a term for that? I think we can take one more before you yeah, take it. So yeah, it's so difficult. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mark, Mark Thatcher. Thank you. I have a question for comment. Uh, the following for name is comments. Um, there are about two themes that, that pop up. You should shout a little bit. I'm oh, getting all the question for comment about two themes that pop up. They, they follow on from what Amy said. Um, the question is, is about learning and uh, recursiveness, which uh, uh, is at the heart of experimentalism. Can you say something about the extent to which uh, policy makers learned or didn't learn, and which level they learned from, and I think at the national level as well? The comment is, um, you present a very nice analysis of the development of ideas, but the bit that seems to be missing is about power and integration, because uh, issues like moral hazard uh, or, or, or the concept of moral hazard can be used in different ways. Uh, and of course, you know, they, they were used by some member states and by some policymakers to gain greater control. Uh, and then they've been used in other ways, which is which would make uh, uh, other aspects of integration more recently the growth of, of European policymaking. So I wonder you know, uh, um, why you give so much emphasis to, to, to ideas. And where where power relations and integration come. So you may wish to take one of those two off in back. <laughs> um, let me maybe go in reverse order. Um, Mark, um, yes, indeed, I'm very much focusing on ideas. And I think the answer is simply because that's me, I'm much more exercised by debating ideas than analysis of power. I'm in power play every day, uh, but um, I find that exciting to do, less exciting to comment upon. Um, no, but that's really true. I think I'm much more exercised by the idea ideation of struggle and the need for clear thinking from time to time. Um, but indeed, obviously, uh, what you say is true. Um, the, the moral hazard argument in, in the initial phase of the, the, the euro crisis was very much about power of creditors versus lack of power of debtors, obviously. Huh? So it was a discourse that accompanied the power imbalance. Absolutely, I agree with that. But that's not the kind, of, that would be an interesting analysis. I agree with that. But that's it's not, indeed, it's not the kind of analysis I've been making. I had it, I was talking about ideas. Because I do believe, um, I do believe that ideas are very important per se, also as generators of policy. Maybe it's naive, maybe it's because I'm so exercised by it. But I do believe it's very important. For instance, the thinking on moral hazards. So I've been thinking about responsibility on moral hazards for 30 years, so basically. Um, First, arguing against people who dismiss moral hazard in social systems, saying, oh, you're wrong, there is an issue. There can be improper use. You have inactivity traps if you are not careful. And moreover, against some good friends of mine, so mostly sociologists, who have a very deterministic view of how people behave, 
saying, no, 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 people make choices. You can hold them responsible, which is a very deep philosophical debate, but I think you can hold people responsible to some degree. Uh, against many of my sociologist friends in, in, in social sciences. Um, but I think you have to find, I think that's an ideational debate, that you have to find the, the exact good balance. Um, and the point I wanted to make is that in fighting people who had a tendency to dismiss moral hazard, you can make the opposite mistake. That is that you don't see the importance of at least sometimes erring towards too much generosity. Uh, sometimes you need that. Um, now, Anton, how would you call this? I should say I forgot that there's been someone in our community of uh, scholars. Was it uh, Wolfgang? Uh, was it, um, what? What? Uh, what? Yeah, no, 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 no. That's wrong. That's wrong. You could say that, that's wrong. You could say it, no, no. You could say it's moral opportunity, but I think um, our colleague Shelpe, I think Waltraud, in some of her papers, has addressed this. Uh, there is something as moral opportunity. That is to say, yeah, she addressed this. Uh, she has the references, I think. That is to say that insurance allows you to take risks. It allows you to take risks. Uh, and it allows you to have a certain leeway in your behavior, which can be important per se. And if you're obsessed by that, you don't see the advantages of that, also in an economic way. So you could, maybe you say there is moral opportunity in the fact that you can say, don't infect your colleagues, stay home if you feel ill, we pay you. And even if maybe you're not very ill or maybe you're not infected. Um, so we should maybe look for something there, but um, I can tell you, for instance, just in Belgium at least, we have this tendency to say, ah, oh, if I have influenza, maybe I have influenza, but I work. That's wrong. I should stay home. I should stay home. Huh? It's that kind of, of, of stuff, um, which I think is important. Um, but we have to look for a word. Um, then the question by Amy, that's a difficult one, and let me be honest, I don't have a ready-made answer. So Amy said, yes, you have a very much a policymaker's take on, on how you tell the story, but what is the take you would offer the citizen? Huh? So, so how, what, what does this mean for the citizen, and how can maybe a positive development at EU level, where solidarity and collective action are organized, how can this reconcile disenchanted citizens with the EU? I should say that it would be easy for me to say, oh yes, I'm not so sure about this. I learned from Teresa that she's been, she's working with you, Teresa should produce stuff on this. She's working on COVID and identity. Uh, so you might produce empirical stuff on this. But I, I, uh, I hesitate a little bit. And let me say why, to be very open. I am very much in favor of joint procurement. So, uh, and, and, and let's say collective action in the purchasing of vaccines. I would go further. I would do it with drugs. We've been, we also, we, are, we have a, a small group of countries with the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Austria. We do joint stuff in, in pharmaceuticals with success. So I'm very much in favor of that. Now, if you upscale your action at EU level, and there's also some drawbacks to the action, like for instance, huge stockpiles of vaccines you might have to destroy. Obviously, the EU is also very fragile there, vis-a-vis -vis citizens' criticism. So I would say upscaling the procurement of vaccines at EU level may please the citizens, I was able to say to my public opinion, also to the opposition in parliament, I was able to say, look, without the advanced purchase agreement of the vaccines, we would have been nowhere, even if Pfizer is in Belgium, they produce in Belgium. But don't believe that they have anything to say. Only everything is decided in the US. Huh? It's not because we have that facility in Belgium, and they just produce. Huh? Um, and so I was able to say, look, the EU is helping us, and so you might then say, okay, that will 
influence people positively in their thinking about the EU and EU solidarity. But on the other hand, you also upscale the fragility of those policies. Huh? We will have to, we, we, we bought too much. Okay, that's inevitable in a sense. So at a certain point in time, you say we, we have too much. You should avoid that. We are putting pressure on the industry to avoid that to a maximum. Now, if at EU level you have that problem, that might be a disadvantage huh? that people say, yeah, but that's the EU again. Huh? They spoiled our money. Huh? So you upscale also vulnerability policies, which then brings me to another point, which I did not say I had it in my preparation, but I rushed over it. I think there is an issue, <clears throat> there's a real but a difficult issue of transparency here in the, the joint procurement and the advanced purchase agreement. I, I admit, I feel uneasy at the prices we pay. We paid and we still pay for vaccines. I feel uneasy. I feel even more uneasy about the prices we pay for the COVID therapeuticals. So we have now new COVID therapeuticals. Health technology assessment, very preliminary, but okay, we buy. Huh? Uh, I feel uneasy about this. Uh, but okay, that's part of the way you deal with the industry. We have a lot of secret contracting. We do it in Belgium but you do it at a very high level and that's a, a double challenge in terms of transparency so i'm not sure that what we do will is a one-way street to more support for the eu i think it is necessary to do it but it's also vulnerable and we should do it well for instance communication on what is happening and i come again back to my need for limits to diversity here we should really as much as possible speak with one voice with the commission Era, the member states on all those issues. My apologies to the many questions that were asked because uh, we are, I think we all agree that we would like to give Jonathan a chance to ask his question. And Jonathan, since it's important to have you heard, I'm going to bring the microphone to you. Okay, I can also. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, that's yeah. also good. Why don't you come in and stand here? That if you can stand next to Frank, and yeah, then yeah, I, I can do that. Yeah. Uh, thanks for this uh, Frank for this wonderful uh, tour d'horizon and reflection on our uh, our interactions, but also really looking to the future and showing us how you are developing your ideas. I, as a, a policymaker and then reflecting on them as a, a policy intellectual or, or academic. I have three comments and I'll try to be even more rough than, than you are to ask you to answer. It's about uh, the open method of coordination uh, versus the community method. And there I would say that um, you know, one way my own ideas and Jack Sable's ideas and others have evolved for quite a long time now uh, is away from this opposition between, let's say, voluntary policy coordination and uh, and legislation. So the experiment is uh, architecture is about, uh, for me, the relationship between goal setting and rulemaking. Uh, on the one hand, uh, implementation, policy, review, revision at different uh, levels. And, um, you know, I, I will talk a, a bit about the um, research I and others have been doing over, over the past uh, 10 years. And you'll see that most of it is about um, different forms of, uh, of regulation which have uh, legal foundations. So I don't think of it in terms of that. Uh, opposition. I think it's a great strength. I agree with you there and uh, uh, that the European Pillar of Social Rights brings together, uh, you know, setting a framework for policy coordination and legislation and also uh, guiding uh, jurisprudence. And we have uh, Sophie Dura in the world who's writing a thesis which makes exactly uh, that, uh, that argument. Um, where I would say the, the OMC is having in the social field as, as uh, kind of having had its limitations is that it was very good, has been very good at uh, exchanging ideas at a relatively high level and diffusing them across member states, but it rarely gets down to learning at a sufficiently uh, granular level, like how, how would you do 
customized uh, social care um, you know in a, in a neighborhood it doesn't have too much uh, to to say uh, about that and that has something to do with the the levels uh, indeed you know studying this in the Netherlands the Dutch government is not very good at being able to give guidance to municipalities uh, about that second comment I uh, to ask you to react to um, is um, about uh, the, the new welfare state, social investment, insurance, resilience. And here I have to say, and by the way, we, we, we really first came into contact in 2002, not in the, in the late 90s, but at the moment when the, the book that you commissioned, Why We Need a New Welfare State, um, was, uh, was produced. And in some ways, I still like better, it's an odd thing to say, the more nebulous presentation of the new welfare state than its subsequent elaborations as social investment, uh, as insurance, or as uh, uh, as resilience. And what I miss, but it, it ran as a as a, a a thread, but not maybe sufficiently theorized or uh, thematized, is the the role of services, the problem of integration of services uh, or programs uh, at uh, at different levels that you that you mentioned and i don't think that is really captured either by the idea of social um, social investment or the idea of combining it uh, with uh, with insurance i mean a lot of this also has to do with what we would call social assistance or um, you know uh, payments which are made as of uh, as of right access to healthcare is not, it goes well beyond uh, insurance and in many systems is not uh, organized in terms of uh, insurance. So if we think that people need uh, integrated customized services, um, and part of that is also helping them to get access to certain kinds of benefits, which may be insurance benefits, which may be citizens benefits or means tested benefits, can we really capture that uh, properly with the conceptual uh, vocabulary we need to, to think uh, beyond. And the last point very quickly, and it links to Mark Thatcher's uh, point, uh, you talked about uh, you know, guidelines for the use of vaccines. Uh, and the question is, you know, how do we get these guidelines and how do we update them? That's crucial. I mean, you might not have been very happy if uh, you were outvoted by the other ministers who all wanted to suspend uh, access to uh, to AstraZeneca. So what seems very important, whatever guidelines you give, is to be able to update them uh, regularly on the basis of, of real life information about what's going on. There, the uh, the idea of pharmacovigilance, which uh, Emma is pretty strong on, is probably a world leader in, may give us some pointers, and maybe you can say something about that. Maybe less telegraphic. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for Jonathan. As always, very challenging. Uh, I'll disagree. I think I'll uh, maintain a kind of a bit of a disagreement on your first point. Um, try to answer your number two, number three, one more or less. Um, I think I, I understand very well what you mean, Jonathan, when you say that in your work, this bifurcation, this strong contradiction between soft OMC and hard legislation, that obviously that's too simple. I fully agree. However, there are real differences and it's real year. It's a different game if you have rather a soft approach rather a legislative approach. Let me give an example just out of my experience now. Some people in the room may remember that um, when we first started discussing the political social rights that I said, my personal view, I feel no record on that, was that the most important uh, principle in the pillar for me, the most immediate and urgent and interesting principle in the pillar was the principle about access to social protection. The principle that said basically every European 
black effort he or she is in which sector he or she is working whatever uh, whatever the personal statute he or she should have access to adequate social protection for a number of reasons i thought that's really the most urgent principle to work on because of developments in labor markets uh, blah 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 uh, very challenging, for instance, for the Dutch government, which was nervous about this. I think David knows that. He also informed me about that. Very nervous about it because obviously it was a kind of an attack on the proliferation of the ZZP phenomenon. Okay. So I said that is really the key principle. Then the Commission first uh, studied the possibility for legal action on that principle. Then they saw that this would be very difficult. And then they went for a recommendation. I said, as a scholar, to a number of friends, okay, fine, let's not let's not start weeping about this, let's not complain too much. That recommendation might be an interesting instrument. Okay. Other parts of the uh, pillar have been translated with the community method in law. The pay transparency principle, the uh, compatibility of personal life, it's a professional life, that's legislation. Now, I'm not the other side of the frontier. I'm a national policymaker. I asked, obviously, my administration to work very hard on our national action plan in response to the recommendation, the recommendation, soft recommendation on access to social protection. So under my pressure, they produced enormous documents. It was good. However, let's be honest, the impact of this exercise on national policies is very limited. It's very limited for a number of reasons. You can use it. I think in Holland one should use it to further the discussion on the ZZP phenomenon. But the impact on, on Belgian policies, I think, is in fact extremely limited. Whilst you feel the impact of the legislation that's been issued on the base of the pillar. It's not a big issue. But you, you have to abide and you have to change certain stuff. And some discussions we had in the Belgian Council of Ministers, we say, oh, but the European, uh, the directive says this, the regulation says that. And often in a positive sense, not always. So there is a real difference. And I think it, we should not kind of try to deny that. The recommendation remains soft and therefore, in a certain sense, relatively weak sometimes. Even if you have a national minister who says, oh, we use that. Oh, okay. Yeah, but so I kind of I think that that it's really about a bit different registry in a sense. Um, but I agree with you then when you say that the weakness of the OMC indeed it was also very high level. Was, Learning becomes interesting if you go into the detail. I, I, there, I fully agree. But then you need peer review. You need real peer review with, with clubs of countries, which happens, but maybe that's insufficiently developed still. So th there is a difference between peer review, which can be incisive because you go into the detail, and indeed the open method of coordination. There, I think you have to put them. Your second point, you say that my kind of bringing together social investment and social insurance. That that is still lacking, still something is lacking when we think about the welfare state of the future. Uh, that's an interesting point. Obviously, my immediate reaction would be to say what you describe, what you describe in our jargon and in what we practice, it's the capacity to be outreaching. Um, to give an example on which I've been working over the past few days. Um, we have a system that gives privileged access to an extra beneficial system in healthcare. And what we do on energy is linked to that system. It's the same, basically, the same system. And we do, there is huge non take up. There's huge non take up. You can address that by local services. And I've also been telling that on some radio last week. I know of some municipalities in Belgium who address it because they are outreaching and you have to do it locally. But I'm not sure so that being outreaching in order to make rights real and to invest and make investments real 
I'm not sure that that's a third ideational pillar. So I'm, but maybe we should clarify in, in the break or something, or you should write me a mail or come back to it. I, for me, in terms of functions, investing in people and ensuring people are functions, being outreaching, if that is what you mean, yes, that's absolutely necessary and you should do it locally and you can see the differences, but, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Then uh, your third point is an interesting one. You say, Frank, here you say that you want common European guidelines on how you use the vaccines, but you would have been very unhappy if you would have been in the minority. No, no, no. It's a typical prisoner's dilemma situation. It would be better for me anyway, even if the, the decision is not exactly what I would have decided, to have a uniform European policy in how we use the vaccines. In terms of the credibility of the vaccine campaigning, uh, the cross-border effects would be much, much better. And so it's, it's a prisoner's dilemma situation. I can personally think, mm, if the others decide this, I would like to decide that. But it's much better to be unvoted and to have a common position. I tell you something, if on the monkeypox, we have a, a small uh, stock, there are only two countries in Europe which have a bigger stock, but these are neighbors. The Netherlands and France, which is annoying for me. Okay, the French policy on how you use the monkeypox vaccine is totally different from ours. You cannot explain that. It's, so I would prefer to be outvoted and to have a, I would prefer to have a common stockpile, exclusively bought jointly and common guidelines. Much as Jonathan wants to have a retort, you did not get the chance. Next time, tomorrow you get your chance. Um, we have a 15 minute coffee break. So stretch your legs, have a cup of coffee. Uh, the yard here in the middle is actually quite lovely. If you haven't checked it out, I would re strongly recommend it. If Frank has energy, he might be able to take the questions that we weren't able to um, take in the plenary. Um, but uh, join me in thanking Frank from the Vita. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second session of this seminar to honor the scholarship of Jonathan Seidel. And this session will be about one of his main themes, especially of the last 15 or 20 years, experimentalist covenants. And you could argue that experimentalist covenants is a notion that has a very good record in the work of famous political scientists like John Dewey and uh, Charles Lindblom and others. And it would be unfair to say that all the wisdom and insight in that tradition is not present in experimental scoffness. But it would be equally unfair to say that experimental scoffness is just an elaboration of that tradition. I think it at least adds two different things to that. The first is the insights that if you do experimental scoffness, this is not just going through a process. It is also a lot of politics about it. For instance, the field of power, and that power is a very subtle kind of powering that is involved. There's nothing like just uh, power in the shadow hierarchy, or that sort of notion is not more subtle than that. And I think it's fair to say that Jonathan and his co workers have done a lot of work trying to elucidate how then it does work and how to, what the institutional implications of that are. The second is that it's not just a prescription. It is a prescription maybe, but it's definitely also a smart state of sketching how institutions in different European polities have evolved into an architecture that is really well suited to support something like experimentalist governance and how if in fact de facto this has been evolved from a lot of different processes. But I think these are at least two reasons and probably much more. Okay? to say that it is not just a new fruit from the existing tree, it is really some new, important, and insightful scholarship. And that's what we will celebrate in this session with three well-known speakers, and I'll introduce them as they, in the order that they will appear. Uh, the first one will be Mark, we will go from more general to more specific talks I have understood. The first is Mark Thatcher, a full professor in public policy at the University of Lewis in, in Rome. 
focusing a lot on compared to public policy and regulation in, in Europe, and also key to link all this work to issues of cultural heritage and identity. Uh, the second speaker will be sitting next to the other side, since it's by another Ancolini, uh, who we know all well here at the University of Amsterdam, as you have been a postdoc here, you've also been a fellow at many different other places, and you're right now a lecturer in the Department of Politics at the University of York. And um, the third speaker sitting next to you is Christina Eckes, who is a professor of European law at our university and the director of ACES, the Amsterdam Center for European Law, ACES, the European Center for European Law and Governance. She's also a member of the governing board of the Amsterdam Center of European Studies and one of the leaders of the theme of Europe in the world. And your current interests are on the legal limits of European integration, separation of powers within the European Union and sovereignty in the 21st century. Okay, welcome all. We are grateful that you are here today. Um, you have been asked to talk for about 10 minutes. Hans Kolk, who also would speak to you, cannot be here for health reasons, unfortunately. Uh, that means that you have a bit more time. So you may take 12 minutes. If you start to see that into the direction of 15, I will start to make that clear. <laughs> yeah? Okay, so please, Mark, go ahead. Sit. So, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here um, and honored to be able to pay tribute to Jonathan and his work. And I'll make a start off on, on a personal note. You know, one of the characteristics of Jonathan is his generosity. Personal generosity, professional generosity, which we alluded to, uh, intellectual generosity. Uh, every time I talk with Jonathan, I have two feelings. One is how ignorant I am, uh, and the other is, I mean, he, he's, he, he has a, a knowledge which is remarkable, and the other is that I'm learning. Uh, and that shows a trem tremendous generosity. Um, let me the, the, the other part, his intellectual generosity, but also his intellectual strength. Um, so Jonathan, I think, makes a key distinction between personal relations and intellectual disagreement. Right? Uh, and he rather likes intellectual disagreement. Uh, now, some people may find that difficult. Critical comments were, were, were referred to. Uh, some of us find that rather stimulating. Uh, you know, Jonathan is going to put you through your paces, uh, and it's nothing personal. He may destroy your argument, but it's actually not personal. On the contrary, it's part of his generosity. Uh, and I find that rather, rather stimulating. Uh, so, yeah, that's... Uh, uh, and, of course, intellectually, he's very tough. Um, and that's good. There's a high standard of rigor, uh, and you have to think, defend yourself, and occasionally fight back. Uh, most of the time, uh, modify your, your view. There's no imposition, uh, but you have to, yeah, you're, you're faced with a, with a rigorous counter argument, and that's good. Uh, and part of that intellectual depth, I think, or a lot of it, comes from his uh, remarkable uh, breadth. Uh, you can't do this today, but Jonathan has worked in history, sociology, political science, public policy, political economy. Today, sadly, this is not allowed. You are supposed to uh, uh, have your dis your sub -dis your discipline, your sub discipline, your sub sub discipline, uh, etc. So this is incredible academic breadth, I think. Uh, uh, which, which is a, a remarkable achievement to be able to, to move uh, uh, from these different disciplines and, and to integrate them. And I suppose experimental governance uh, 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 comes out of that. You know? It draws on these different disciplines. Uh, and I'd like to say something about my sub-sub-discipline, since sadly I'm, I am confined to uh, uh, my sub-sub-discipline, um, and talk about its contribution to work on European regulation, integration, uh, and, and public policy. So I think one of the kind of key strengths of this uh, experimentalism uh, uh, is that it uh, is sui generis. It, 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 it's general. Right? So Frank talked about the EU as being sui generis. I think the strength of the theory is it's not sui generis. It's general. Uh, and uh, uh, as you will know, uh, or many will know, there's been a long debate in studies of European integration as to whether or not we should have 
specific theories for integration or whether we should draw on more generic theories. Um, and at the beginning, uh, EU studies had its own vocabulary, its own theories, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then this was attacked. Uh, but I think one of the points about Jonathan's work is that he bridges this. Uh, you have both a general theory and you have its application to the EU. I think that's a, 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 a tremendous strength when we're, we're looking at the EU. Whether the EU is special is another point. Uh, EU exceptionalism for me follows French exceptionalism, uh, American exceptionalism. Uh, the British even claim to be exceptional, but they're usually wrong. Um, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I think there's a second point about experimentalism that's very important, which is that it gets away from a very top-down view of, of European policy. Right? Most of the time, we, you know, we've been focused on directives, uh, uh, what the Commission has done, what the Council has done, uh, but actually the process is much more complex than that. And uh, uh, experimental experimentalist governance uh, uh, forces us to uh, think about what's happening at other level, forces us to think about that movement between these different levels. And that brings me to another point about it. Um, it has a sophisticated set of processes. Um, if one thinks of some of the uh, uh, original theories of Europe integration, they're powerful, but they're highly oversimplified. Uh, uh, at the same time, this isn't just a set of correlations. There's a, a, a very uh, sophisticated group of processes that are um, investigated. So the final point comes uh, uh, out of the question I asked Frank earlier, that uh, uh, these process br processes bring in power. Um, I think that there's been a, 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 a danger of treating the EU as a kind of aseptic organization. Power is something dirty, it might happen in the council. It's all these horrible national politicians, but actually the EU uh, isn't doing much powering. Uh, well, actually the EU is doing a great deal of powering. Uh, and I think uh, uh, that's brought out in, in his work uh, without neglecting uh, uh, the role of uh, other matters such as ideas uh, and, uh, and learning. It set an agenda, I think, uh, uh, set an agenda uh, which is now being developed. Uh, we're now thinking about uh, what happens after experimentalism, experimentalist governance. Uh, we're thinking about how sustainable it is over time. We're thinking about the distinction between experimentalist institutions and experimentalist practices. Uh, and we're thinking about when it happens, when it doesn't happen. Right? But this is good. This is part of the way that social science operates, that uh, 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 people set an agenda uh, and that agenda is then taken forward. Uh, it uh, leads to critiques, uh, uh, counter movements, uh, but it also becomes part of a mainstream <laughs> set of tools and theories. And I think that's what's happened with experimental governance. Um, so those, I think, are my, my broad uh, uh, views. I think uh, uh, and Reza are going to look at more specific issues. Uh, uh, they are more expert in this than I am, uh, but I wanted to try and place the work in, I think, the wider context of uh, studies of uh, Europe integration, policy making and regulation. So thank you, Jonathan, for having set an agenda and thank you also for your, your generosity and your rigor. And thank you, Mark Fesser. No, no, no. You already have been announced twice now. Yes, so, yes. Without further ado. Thanks. So thanks a lot for the invitation as well. Uh, I'm going to build on, uh, on the context uh, that Mark has just outlined. I'm going to say something a bit more specific, more uh, substantive, uh, and also uh, you know, combined with some personal uh, remarks, including uh, how, uh, as it has already been said, Jonathan can or usually is tough. Um, so let me start by saying how I first met Jonathan. Uh, actually, that was at the summer school organized by the Amsterdam Center for European Studies and the Amsterdam Center for European Law and Governance. I was towards the beginning of my PhD. I was a bit uncertain whether I was going to make it. I just had a minor surgery. And then in the end, I made it. And that was really, I mean, I'm very happy of that because that has you know, turned out to be very influential on me and my, and my career. 
In my PhD, I looked at electricity and gas, so extremely salient uh, uh, domains at the moment. I don't have any advice on how you can reduce your bills. <laughs> And by comparing the two sectors, uh, I, uh, well, my critique and contribution uh, was that uh, the experimentalist literature by Jonathan, by Saxable and others, had at that point uh, convincingly documented the widespread uh, emergence of experimentalist structures, such as regulatory fora, net networks of national regulators, uh, EU network agencies, uh, well, one thing is to have an institutional structure, another one is to use it in practice. So I've looked at that. And what I found is that uh, indeed uh, structures and behavior not always uh, uh, equate to one another. So in electricity, for example, to liberalize markets and to integrate them, the European Commission extensively used the Florence Forum hosted by the EUI. Uh, and use that institutional setting to come up with uh, uh, rules uh, uh, in a joint manner based on the review of national implementation experiences. So this is precisely what experimentalism expects to happen. But in gas, uh, the commission overall followed a different approach. It came up with rules in a much more hierarchical manner. These rules are supposed to be stable, not revisable. Uh, these rules were formulated in uh, uh, much closer circles, so it was much less inclusive as a process. And then uh, this was followed by compliance enforcement, so hierarchical goals. I have to say that in, uh, in later work, I found basically the same pattern also within the given policy domain. So if we look, for example, at competition policy applied to the digital sector, there again we find some variation. Same institutional structure, you may have different processes in practice. So when the commission tackles cartels, it follows a very hierarchical approach. It can rely on a pre-established template, and then it really monitors the national competition authorities following. But when the commission had to regulate Google, it didn't really know what to impose. The commission knew that there was a problem, but didn't know how to solve it. And so it explicitly required that it was a giant to develop rules itself. The commission at the same time set up provisions and arrangements so that the effectiveness of these rules uh, could be uh, evaluated. And when the rules proposed and, uh, and implemented by Google were ineffective, then Google was uh, obliged to come up with new proposals and better remedies. So, let me say at this point that uh, my relationship with Jonathan has taken a variety of forms, uh, formal and informal. Um, uh, these include, for example, the fact that he acted as my PhD external examiner, so I was uh, between a rock and a hard place, uh, <laughs> and uh, I managed to impress him, apparently, even really? though I had not managed to sleep a, a single hour the night before the, the Vibam. <laughs> and, uh, and indeed, he then recruited me as a postdoc here at the University of Amsterdam in a project led by, by Bridget and, and Frank Schimmelfeld at the UI. This was the basis uh, for, our, uh, for our joint works, which then resulted in a joint publication. So in one research, we looked at the evolution of experimentalist governance over time. Uh, and here our starting point is, um, okay, uncertainty is well known to be the key engine for experimentalism, but it is very plausible uh, to imagine that once actors um, have already navigated for some time a given policy environment, once they've started learning something about it, then uncertainty will gradually decline. So it can be argued uh, experimentalism is uh, bound to be self-limited. Okay, it is, it really leads to its own exhaustion. Okay, so we tested this hypothesis and we actually largely disconfirmed it. We found, we cannot of course uh, exclude that this uh, ever happens, but what we found is that also in domains where actors have been navigating for decades, they often face re-emergencies of answer. In another more recent work, which has just been uh, published, uh, we compared banking and electricity. And there we find a, a strange animal, which touches uh, upon some of the things that Frank uh, uh, said earlier on. Um, 
So, of course, uh, the starting point here is that in many settings, uh, there are very strong reasons, very good reasons to get uniform rules. Think of interdependencies, think of uh, the need to uh, avoid arbitrage, think of, uh, uh, of the desire of creating a level playing field. But of course, that is problematic from a legitimacy perspective, from the accommodation of diversity typical of, of EU and, and of other uh, policies as well. By comparing electricity and banking, we saw a strange, a strange animal emerging, that is the combination of uh, uh, synchronic uniformity, so rules that are uniform at a given point in time and increasingly detailed, coupled, however, with joint processes and revisions. So we call this a combination of uh, uh, synchronic uniformity and diachronic revisability. And in our interpretation, this is a simplified experimentalist architecture, because in the classic experimentalist architecture, the starting point is uh, broad framework goals and much discretion to lower level actors. Here we see less discretion. But nevertheless, we also see the typical joint reviews and revisions at the heart of experimentalism. And what we argue, um, and, and we are uh, trying to then test the capacity of these findings to travel to other domains. What we argue is that this combination, this, this uh, new metamorphosis of experimentalist governance might be able to, to uh, uh, offer the best of both worlds. Functionally, uh, uh, functionally needed uniform rules on the one side, but processes that are seen as more legitimate from, from the involved actors. Why? Because they are involved in the processes to create them and revise them, and because they know already that these rules are contestable, are revisable. So let me just uh, then conclude by saying uh, that uh, indeed, uh, I, I was very happy to make it to this uh, summer school some, some years ago. And uh, uh, I can genuinely say that working with Jonathan is really, is really uh, an incredible experience. Uh, he's very thorough, he's very meticulous, he listens and reads very carefully what you say and what you write. Of course, sometimes, uh, sometimes you wish that he was not so meticulous and rigorous because then he comes you know, with very strong points and, and he can hammer you with, with those. <laughs> but I mean, that, that's you know, part of, of, of the process. So uh, thanks, Jonathan, for all these uh, uh, formal and informal interactions, and I hope that there will be many more to come in the next years. Thank you, Bernardo. And I give the floor to Christiane. Yeah, uh, Christina. Christina, yeah. sorry. Um, thanks. Very difficult to follow that up, particularly on the personal note. My first comment is the generosity that I've always uh, experienced from Jonathan, but that has already been said so many times that I can just maybe add from my perspective that I, of course, have the uh, benefit and also the pleasure to experience that from a very junior perspective onwards. So I joined the University of Amsterdam as a postdoc, and Teresa said that there was always interaction at eye level, and that is something that I really can relate to very well. So my generosity that I want to emphasize, of course, I have benefited at, at so many levels of your generosity of time and your sharing of ideas, but also advice and insights into university politics. You have been a friend of all the projects at the um, FDR, so the um, law faculty that I have been involved in or later led. So anything from architecture, where we have very nostalgic feelings of the very early days, to law and justice, the next project, the sustainable global economic law even, and uh, even Seferov, so the separation of powers project that I need now. And every time I can say, yes, we benefit from your insights as a non-lawyer knowing law so well that you show us things that we didn't see before. So I think, that is in substance what I have throughout benefited from. And also personally, I continue to benefit from your advice, for example, on my grant application. Admittedly, my move from my earlier ERC to now my VG application is very much influenced by you saying, just put it all away and make a, you know, an overview of this, so make a very different approach. <laughs> and, um, so I think in many ways, I at times have disagreed, but uh, often after thinking about it for a longer period of time, uh, I have come closer to your original position. And I also, when I came here, of course, wondered um, 
what how shall I link link what I say to your work? And I was looking for an example of a triumph of experimentalism, if you like. And since I now work with uh, climate mitigation a lot, I feel in many ways that there's no there's no field that to me speaks so vividly on a triumph of experimentalism than global governance of climate change mitigation. If you go through the different COP meetings and you see how we have moved from 1997, the aim, the, 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 the perspective of binding um, reduction targets in Kyoto. And, we, and, and that was really legally what people aimed for, not that it materialized, but that was the aim. And then moving to Copenhagen where that failed entirely, of course. So where we okay, we established the two degrees, but the whole idea of binding targets was basically a failure. Then seeing that from that, where we really saw, let's say the limitations of of law and how it wasn't ratified and there was no commitment. And um, yeah, and building from that actually the idea of a more bottom up process in so many ways. So the nationally determined contributions and the idea, and of course there's the legal discussion on to what degree they are legally binding. And I would side with the people that say, if you read the uh, text of the Paris Agreement, 2015, you must say that the language of shawl, there's a lot to say that when a country commits to a certain reduction target, that that is actually legally binding. But we have certainly seen that, uh, yeah, the limits of binding law have led us to a very different process where also non UNFCCC actions were brought more to the fore, where, where mini lateralism between a certain group of countries comes to the fore, where really transparency, a form of peer review, and also the recurrence of the COPs, of course, and the agreement in Glasgow to now actually come forward every year again as nationally determined contributions. So actually uh, speeding up this process of, the, of reviewing each other's commitments, each other's um, uh, yeah, plans, I think brings this very much to the fore. Where are the limits of binding law, but also where there's room, where there's uncertainties and, and, and moving insights and this polycentricity of power, how, how experimentalism can actually take form. So that I think I, uh, to me is an example that I wanted to highlight here because it's, uh, yeah, the example I'm studying at the moment. And I think both substantively, and I will get more critical in a minute, and also in the process of how this procedurally moved, one could say it's a triumph of moving outside of the law. So we have now, um, yeah, at least commitments. Well, before Paris, we had commitments that would have led us to, to three degrees warming. Now we have commitments that people say if they, if they come into action, we would lead, would lead us to what 2.1 degree warming. So clearly also a step up in terms of substantive commitments. But, I think at the same time, of course, what I engage in, climate mitigation, is of course an attempt to end this experimentalism, to hold people to account. And I understand experimentalism has a framework of law and works with law. And I mean, this came out also in the tension maybe that you discussed earlier of where is binding law to what extent, uh, uh, um, yeah, well, what is the tension or interaction between the two? But the aim, of course, of climate litigation is to weaponize a system that is meant to be bottom up, that is meant to, as Koskinemi would say, uh, descending, um, uh, sorry, an ascending logic, not a descending logic. So the question of, can we hold countries, not just to what they offer as plans and nationally determined contributions, but can we ask them that that actually meets the objective? So what is their fair share? Can we say, okay, we say now since Glasgow, certainly that we need 1.5 degrees, are you offering enough reductions to actually do your share to reach that. So in a sense, climate litigation, of course, tries to put pressure to weaponize something that is meant to be more ascending and actually work in the opposite direction. And in that, I think we also see the limits of that experimentalism. And I think we see that for several reasons, uh, well, in that specific context. Eh? So we see that for several reasons, certainly the yeah, uh, the geopolitical climate has changed. We have a situation where China says we don't cooperate with the US on 
climate goals any longer. Um, Ukraine war being, of course, there in the background. But that is maybe not so much uh, a question of, of the limits of experimentalism, but the changed conditions, let's say. So one of the conditions of experimentalism to work becomes more difficult if parties are no longer willing to cooperate or no longer able to, to agree on the basic objectives. But of course, what we also see is that the gap of what is agreed in these contexts um, and what we need is something that brings more and more science in. And that is on the one hand, a good thing. So certainly in climate mitigation, we see the deep reliance on science. On the other hand, that also shows, if you look, for example, at the recent report of the Umweltrat in Germany that was behind the Neubauer case, so that was behind the big case in, for the German Constitutional Court, that what the court relied on as its guidelines on what is necessary, uh, said, yeah, well, we are using our carbon budget much more quickly than we are, than actually foreseen. So we must reduce much, much more quickly. And the greater the pressure, of course, the more steeply we need, need to reduce emissions, the more it will be about socioeconomic conflicts, the more it will be about that the rich uh, contribute, well, use all the emissions, contribute to the problem, while the less privileged take the brunt of the consequences of it. And these social conflicts is something where I wonder, and maybe there's more question, or maybe an observation of how I expect it, that I see it much more difficult to integrate in a non-hierarchical, non-legal context where our commitment to basic norms certainly exists, but enforceability is not the same. We don't have the same socio social value system to rely on as you would have in a descending uh, um, reasoning within a constitutional framework. And I want to in include here the EU, of course. So EU lawyers reasoning is always also constitutional in that sense. And that really raises questions of not just participation, but also on how, yeah, how embedded are these social findings and how supported they are by those who suffer the most from both climate change, but also uh, mitigation measures. And I think there I see a challenge for the system that we have. Thank you very much, Christina. It would, I think, be both unwise and pretty much impossible not to benefit at some stage from Jonathan's meticulous generosity. <laughs> but we will delay that until a couple of people from the audience have expressed what they wish to express in terms of issues they want to go further because it raised their curiosity. Criticism they have on things that have been said, important additions they think should be made, or whatever. So, who may I give the floor? Brian. So, I have a, I have a question to the three panelists, and um, for that matter, also uh, Jonathan um, and, and John, the, the chair. Um, so, and it, it's definitely from an outsider's point of view and, and point of view of somebody who thinks about the value of and the incidence of experimentalist governance being very commonly um, connected to the transnational quality uh, or sort of structure of governance. And I know that the concept of experimentalism, um, including the way people were just describing it, the three of you who were summarizing the work, I know that it's meant to be um, a characterizing concept that you know may have more or less traction, maybe more or less complete and relevant, um, but is present in all the different kinds of governance, the levels of governance, I should say, um, that we think of when we think of very local as opposed to more um, you know, provincial, as opposed to national, as opposed to European or, or global. Or, um, some sort of, um, you know, but whatever scale you're looking at, but also whatever sort of constellation. I know that's supposed to be true, but I'm very interested in the the the, the claim that I at least interpreted in, in some of Jonathan's earlier work that there is something causal going on in the characteristic of transnationalism and experimentalism that they 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 mutually enforce each other in a certain way. 
Um, and, 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 and I know that that's a part of the research agenda that none of you may be working on, but I, I want to take a, a comment on that. I want to hear the extent to which, your resentment of the extent to which transnationalism selects for, or um, or the opposite actually can undermine experimentalism because it is so complicated and so difficult and there's so many um, yeah, complex uh, sort of design uh, obstacles that you can't really uh, implement the experiments. So it's not obvious to me that there would be a, an affinity, a positive affinity between these, between transnationalism and experimentalism. But in, in comments on, on this question. Okay, thanks, Brian. Do you want to say some first? Well, sure. Uh, yeah, I think it depends on the circumstances. Huh? I mean, you need a certain agreement. So you need agreement on A, that you want to cooperate, also transnationally, so between different countries, and you need to have some basic principles according to which, or objectives that you pursue, so you must also substantively have some level of agreement. And that is a bit what I meant at the end. If you lose any of that, then it's more difficult. At the same time, I think, yeah, I mean, not that I'm the expert, but transnationalism is, of course, not a hierarchical legal order if i put it back to what i know better so that is what you need for experimentalism because if i can tell you what you must do there's no peer review in that sense or at least i would not read it like that because then i just will tell you what i want you to do and if so you need to have different players that are not in that sense in a power relationship that you would often have in a state so in that sense both i want to say a bit of both maybe so you need to have different players that are not hierarchically dependent on each other. And you need to have basic willingness to cooperate, basic, basic agreement. And then there's, of course, other factors that make it work better. Recurrence you need. Yeah, we had those already. Thanks. Do you wish to add anything to that? So you ask your question, Brown, which is very interesting, but you turned it round in a sense. Uh, um, so like this. my approach to this would be to look at the causal factors that lead to experimentalist governance. And I would do that in two different ways. One of them, which is the dominant one that I know, is, has been variation within European policymaking. But the other we should bring up is um, comparative across systems. So um, I, as it happens, I, I don't think, I think there is a link, but the link isn't um, <coughs> Uh, uh, necessarily 100% uh, explanatory. Um, transnational governance has certain features which um, favor experimentalism. Uh, Christine has also talked already about the, the, the lack of hierarchy. I might bring up a, a couple more. What, one of them is the, the number of actors involved, um, uh, which would encourage uh, cooperation. And um, the other, I suppose, um, and this may be more controversial, is the, the interests of the transnational or supranational actors themselves, um, who, and like this conventional wisdom, of course, want to expand their power. They might not necessarily want to expand all of their responsibilities. They might well wish to cherry pick some of than others, but they want to, ex they want to expand their, their power. So going back to the discussion about OMC in the, the late 90s, etc. And um, for me, I think an OMC looked like a response by the Commission to being blocked from expanding its power in certain directions. So it looked for an, 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 another route. Um, and I think experimentalism is part of that. Um, uh, I think it's. <laughs> They, they, they are not on strike, at least. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose, for me, experimentalism is, is part of a strategy often by the Commission, but also other actors, um, to, to gain power. Um, it, it's uh, often a strategy that's part, that's part of a phase. It's going to be followed by, by other phases, which are more hierarchical. Um, uh, and it's... Uh, uh, it, it's uh, quite quite a conscious strategy. You're blocked here, therefore you you you, you go for experimentalism, uh, and when you can, you make your experimentalism harder. Um, so I suppose that would be a, 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 another feature. But that feature is a generic feature, I think, of um, in, international systems. 
uh, if you would look at the World Trade Organization, uh, my bet would be that you would see similar processes, but, um, and this goes back to how unique is the EU, um, it's a particularly supranational uh, 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 form of transnational governance. And therefore, these processes are stronger, I think, in the EU than, than, than elsewhere. Um, so uh, uh, that's a kind of long answer to say that um, I personally would avoid a, a distinction, go back to the earlier point about uh, um, comparative politics and kind of international systems. I, I think they're linked. Uh, uh, um, but at the same time, you have to take into account the specificities of, of, of the EU. Thank you, Benner. Yeah, I just wanted to, I mean, partially at least, uh, uh, again, build on what Mark said, but it, it, and bringing that in the language of the experimentalist literature, I mean, there are sort of conditions which are under discussion uh, for experimentalist governance. One uh, is uncertainty, so can be associated to environmental volatility, rapid technological changes, etc. Although, in my own research as well, I have found out that sometimes, uh, uh, you know, even in a apparently very volatile sector, uh, actually, let's say the European Commission has a very clear idea of what to do. So we need to be a bit uh, careful on that. Another important scope condition is uh, uh, polyarchy, so a polyarchic distribution of powers. Again, we can we can discuss how to understand that, whether in formal terms, so the rulemaking uh, or the decision-making procedures, uh, but we can also take a de facto, uh, we can look at power, distributions of power in a de facto rather than the euro manner. So if there is a strong coalition of actors and, they, and it is strong enough to be able to impose their view on others, in my opinion, that you are in a hierarchical uh, governance setting. So just to conclude this, what I wanted to link is if, you, if we look at the work by Lindblom, uh, we see that uh, uh, you know some governance processes can be both useful from a cognitive perspective, but also from a political one, uh, in terms of uh, you know creating and mounting consensus. Yeah, I think a lot has been said already. If I may just add one small thing to that, indeed I think relates to what has been said already. That is what, what Paul Captain, one of the earlier European researchers at our university, our departments, uh, called, uh, called the sovereignty dilemma. So the European Union, of course, has emerged from many different considerations, but one of them was that uh, national governments realized that their power over, for instance, transnational firms would be limited unless they would collaborate. And that's uh, what the European Union should be able to do that. But simultaneously, if you create such place because it helps you to maintain your sovereignty, you do not, do not want to give away your sovereignty to the very body. And that led to a whole set of ambiguities in the relationships between these two levels in what we call the hierarchy here. And it's precisely in the ambiguity that the architects have emerged that gave rise to and facilitate experimental governance. But it also means that that sovereignty dilemma, in a more political sense, also generates part of the dynamics that underlies not only its emergence, but also its actual functioning. And I think there is a difference with what you rightly say is also the case, eh, experimental governance and other tiers of governance. Yeah? I have another question. Sure. So um, I'm particularly interested in what Christina was um, talking about because it's very close to my area, environmental governance um, and experimentalism in environmental governance. So Christina, if I understood you correctly, you uh, just suppose to some extent law as a mechanism of uh, fight for climate change and experimentalism, and in a way express a doubt uh, regarding the extent to which socioeconomic conflicts and social injustice could be tackled through experimentalism and, and sort of expressing more uh, sympathy in this regard to legal hierarchies and. Sort of more imposition, more legal economic imposition. And I'm very curious about uh, that relationship. And I wanted to ask you actually talking back, talking you, because in, in one of the events we had in the last year, you said something like you said something like everybody knows, so with climate change, everybody knows 
to what we need to do, but we don't know how to do it in a way that, you know, in a way that society can actually bear it, in a way that tackles the socioeconomic conflict, in a way that there will actually be collective action possible in our society, right? And I, I would, to me, it seems that, you know, what experimentalism is mostly about, but there seems to be a big question of lenses here, but to me, it's mostly about contextual solutions which are carried by the co-ownership of people who are um, concerned by certain problems or who are affected by certain problems. So it seems to me with this socioeconomic uh, injustice question that that is particularly important, at least in principle, that those conflicts are resolved in a contextual manner by people who are uh, directly affected. Of course, the question of power and how they're excluded from certain processes of finance reasons is a very pertinent one, but I wonder whether that's a principal critique of experimentalism and how law will overcome that, uh, you know, as an alternative. Um, and then my second comment would be that with law, uh, with the best possible, most beautiful law, you still need implementation. And I think that is the insight again, which is so wonderful. It's not only an experimental insight, but it is the insight to that rule making, that rule that application. That this is where things are changing, and, and this is where things are happening on the ground. Uh, so that that is just to say that here again, you need some form of participatory involvement of people who are affected by those problems. Yeah. So that's Thank you. I don't yeah. know if that was actually a question. No, no, no. I, I know. I think it's an excellent question. Um, whether I, well, I will just pick out some things and you tell me whether I didn't address any other part of what said. Whether I juxtaposed law and experiment and to a degree I did, yeah? but that I also see why you say that you shouldn't. Yeah? I mean, I, I, I didn't I didn't mean to say black and white. First, so first of all, I would think, but I mean, maybe John should answer that. You need a framework of law for experimentalism. There is a framework of law to, to rely relate to. It doesn't happen in 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 the vacuum to a degree. So that's number one. And I also think um, that it, of course, can lead to to legal arrangement in certain ways, at least ultimately. But uh, so I, I, on the one hand, I don't. On the other, hand, I like how you framed it, namely that it plays in a different mm -hmm. register or something like that. You said, and I think as a lawyer, that's what I believe. Huh? That there's a different bilayness enforcement level. That there's a different that it plays in a different register. I think is a good way of framing it. So yes, I would nonetheless make that distinction, and I think you need that distinction, at least in my understanding of experimentalism, because if I can force people simply to do what they're meant to do, then it doesn't. Then it's not experimentalism it's this exchange it's this sort of voluntary if you like uh, review and, and then transparency and then pushing others that is part of it that's more like nudging let's say or whatever yeah but not binding in that legal sense that i would see law as binding but you you, you also related, and I find that maybe the, the more interesting aspect to the question of uh, integrating value choices and, 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 and the, the how we reduce emissions. I mean, I would still stick to, you know, what we need to do. We need to reduce emissions. And the how, there's of course, everything we do every day makes emissions. Eh? I don't want to even look at this room saying that we are part of the group of people that produces these emissions. Eh? We are not part of the people that suffers the most. We are part of the people that produces those emissions. And there's, of course, a million ways in which you uh, could, as a society, address that. And I see your point of saying that experimentalism can offer these contextual solutions to these things. At the same time, it raises, I think, the core question of that participation generally raises. Eh? is what participation structures do we have? Who uses them and in what way? And um, in my view, experimentalism has there two things that I would think of as weaknesses. And that is that in this experimentalist exchange, 
science has a very high standard. So it's, if you look at whatever the IPCC, it has been criticized and maybe that's now, now the, the classic Yasanov uh, argument that it's very non-embedded in social choices that it's taken out of, of the subjective experience of climate change. We have seen that now suddenly in the, in, in the Netherlands and in Germany in August, many more people were, were than before in polls were willing to whatever, uh, set off emissions when they fly and do certain things. Yeah, that was like a whole little questionnaire. Yeah, of course, because we have the heat, hottest summer ever and people still had a subjective experience of maybe something that they thought in whatever way, make them feel consequences of climate change. So I do think that this aspect of subjective experience is more difficult to feed into than into a classic democratic legitimation of things. And I think that's generally a problem when you speak about participation also in the EU. Who is those people who participate? I, are these really the people that take the brunt of, 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 of the consequences of climate change? Most likely not, would be my, my answer. Well, often they're not well enough organized to do that, neither globally nor within a country. But um, that relates to power and these structures that exist and who can make the argument in a way that it's heard and these questions and uh, yeah, and science. So these are the two things, the participation aspect and the science aspect of that reliance on science and on, on abstract concepts and on, on insights that are consciously disconnected from the subjective. So intersubjective arguments is something as a lawyer, I'm very comfortable with that. Yeah, that's uh, how you also make legal arguments, but in many ways that is nonetheless something that I would think then both the law maybe and experimentalism we must see how to answer to that to make people actually want to implement whatever they're if we look at individual level huh? i mean if you think of state implementation we of course completely that's a completely different question again there's time for one additional intervention from the audience if there's someone who has a point to make you right yeah <laughs> Yeah. 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 You know, at the point where experimental drugs occurred, and that's the point of initiative, as opposed to what it was previously happening, uh, what role there is, or what, um, how legitimacy of the decision would have produced back within, maybe the legitimacy of whatever the previous arrangement there was, to make decisions beyond just the idea that, like, oh, like, um, of just assuming that everything is very new, or that a new challenge or the issue, I think of how, I guess, you know, how. Uh, experimental relation to the definition of decision and decision making, um, whether or not the problem is being new. Thank you. I think Mark uh, wishes to respond to that. So, so I pick, pick up this point, perhaps a point about implementation. So I think the question you're raising is an important one, which is as there's recursiveness in uh, um, uh, experimentalist governments. But there's also an issue about what lessons are learned, uh, uh, with, with, with which uh, um, experiments are taken up uh, and under which criteria, which are put to one side. And I think this is one of the challenges. Um, uh, and you know, this is where first, I think, one of the parts of the, of, of the agenda for, for experiment, experimentalism, um, which is questions of legitimacy, most questions of power. Um, the, what is a good lesson? Um, and that isn't necessarily obvious or, or shared by everyone. Um, so I think that comes into the question of um, when you get different experiments, when you get implementation, that's been looked at before. Uh, but then there's an issue about um, how the, the, the feedback loop works, uh, how the recursive part uh, 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 works, um, how those experiments are interpreted. Which, which are uh, uh, actually used, which are regarded as being uh, uh, normatively 
uh, uh, good and which should be put to one side. And I think there's quite a lot of work to be done there as well uh, uh, to, to investigate the, what, what lessons are being learned from these, from these multiple experiments. I just wanted to add that indeed, if, if we look, for example, at the use of reviews or impact assessments, for example, I mean, they can uh, serve, let say, the function that they are expected to serve in an experimental cycle, but they can also be ignored where, you know, they give results that maybe the key decision maker doesn't really like, or they can be, conduct they can be conducted after rather than before uh, policy making and reviews. So, so indeed, there is also room for manipulation and coordination. Thank you. Jonathan, your generosity has been called for. <laughs> well, first, I just want to thank three such good friends and excellent colleagues for the, the generous things that they have said about me. And I have really uh, valued our interactions and collaborations both at the person at the professional level. Um, I found uh, you know, the remarks um, by um, Mark and Bernardo there, broadly speaking, uh, I mean, not, not so much on the critical side, raising uh, issues uh, and asking some questions, or in Bernardo's case, providing some answers about how they fit into the larger framework. And they're very much in line with some of the issues that I'm going to talk about uh, in my own talk tomorrow. So I won't go uh, very far uh, with that. Let me respond a little bit to some of the things that, uh, that Christina has said. I also link them to Brian's questions. I think it's a really pertinent one. I mean, uh, they link together. So maybe we'd like to start very briefly with, uh, with Brian's question, which is about, okay, what about, uh, is there something that is specific about experimental that is particularly applicable to transnational governance, or are there actually features of transnational governance that could be problematic? And one could also ask the other side, what about, you know, the, the local? And so here, you know, I would indeed start to answer uh, by reference, as Bernardo did, by reference to the scope conditions for uh, experimental in terms of uh, strategic uncertainty, polyarchy, diversity, and interdependence. And I think that you can have uh, not only um, too little of these uh, conditions, but you can also have too much of them. So uh, beyond a certain level, of, uh, of interdependence, as Bernardo was saying, and, and describing our really work, if you combine high uh, uncertainty and high interdependence, you need a form of experimentalism, which does it in one moment uh, have uniform uh, common rules for the group of, of uh, actors in question, but those rules have to be made and revised uh, experimentally. And similarly, and this is something I will talk about um, tomorrow, um, if you have uh, too much diversity, too much uh, polyarchy, uh, it can be, um, as was said, that you have difficulty reaching uh, a common problem formulation and, and uh, common goals and, uh, and common uh, rules. But at that point, then uh, I would argue uh, you can start smaller. So groups of actors who are willing to act together, who can reach a common, what Chuck said will be called, thin uh, consensus and start to uh, develop uh, experimentalist uh, policies and, uh, and regimes. And then there are mechanisms for joining them up together uh, horizontally. And uh, in fact, uh, I would say that that's much more what we're really seeing uh, in the, uh, the global climate issue than that uh, the UNFCC process can really be understood as an experimentalist uh, process. And here, I would just encourage everybody to read the wonderful new book uh, by Jack Sable and David Victor called Fixing the Climate, which really develops this uh, line of argument and explains uh, why, um, let's say, the, the UN uh, climate process 
is fundamentally different from the Montreal pro, uh, protocol for fixing the uh, the ozone layer and, and how the latter really uses uh, the the detailed knowledge of different uh, actors to uh, test and advance uh, knowledge about, for example, whether there are feasible substitutes for ozone uh, layer destroying uh, substances. In any case, um, I would not, um, and I guess this is, this is clear, you see, I would not want to oppose uh, law and experimentalism in this way, partly because I actually, I, th I think that I have the, that the concept of law is much less uh, determining for me. Um, you cannot tell people uh, what to do if you don't already yourself know what to do. And that's something that we see, uh, you know, so uh, you know, so strongly in the climate field. So we can have the you know, the Rohenda decision, which tells the Dutch government, you know, you are obliged. Uh, to increase your efforts to contain, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and rising temperatures, but it doesn't tell them how to do it. And so, from that point of view, uh, I would think of um, these climate climate litigation and also litigation like that of the, uh, you know, the. the, the uh, high court decision, the Council of State decision here about nitrogen as a penalty default. Uh, it puts the actors under enormous pressure legally, so you can't do certain kinds of things. In the case of nitrogen, you can't get out of the more permits until you uh, find a way of uh, a system that will prevent nitrogen emissions from damaging nature, protecting nature areas, but it does not tell. The actors concern how to do it. Now, they are precisely the kind of like, uh, local uh, customization, looking at the place specific uh, dimensions, and also uh, drawing not just on scientific models, but also uh, on the, the practical experience of implementing solutions in different areas becomes like, crucial. That is also one of the reasons why the Dutch government is failing so badly uh, in its uh, attempts to respond to the, the penalty default of the, of the nitrogen uh, decision. But that is a, is a longer discussion about the interaction between uh, what law can try to do and how different actors respond to it, which I think you're also deeply interested in. Thank you, Joachim. And, and uh, thank you, Mark, Bernardo, and Christiana for not only elucidating the riches of all the body of work on experimental problems, but also touching upon a couple of those issues that probably will keep us busy for the next few years in further thinking and further debating this particular way of looking into transnational governance. Thank you very much, and let's go for the next round. So welcome back everybody, uh, nice to see so many of you also in the room. Uh, we are now continuing with uh, the next panel, which is about the political economy, and I'm very happy to welcome a uh, very distinguished group of uh, people and friends of Jonathan here on the, uh, on the panel. Um, the first one who will be speaking is Gary Perigo, who's a professor in the College and Division of Social Sciences at the University of Chicago. And we were just talking that he's probably the person in the room who knows Jonathan for the longest. Uh, next up will be Anton Hemelijk, who's a professor in political science and sociology at the European University Institute in Florence. And uh, it's also interesting to note that he was together uh, with Jonathan, the co-founder of a Access Europe, as it was still called back then, or allowed to be called back then. <laughs> um, and uh, in this, in this um, function, of course, has a very important role for ACES today. And uh, to my right is Amy Vaudin. She's currently visiting professor in European politics and political economy 
uh, at the University of Leiden and also a full professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Victoria in uh, Canada. And finally, here on Zoom, uh, I welcome uh, Marisa Pereira, who's a full professor of political science at the Faculty of Political, Economic and Social Sciences at the University of Milan. Um, so we have one more person in the panel than in the previous panel. So this means that we have to be a bit strict on time, which is actually not my highest quality. I will do my best to, to uh, keep the time as good as possible. Uh, so everybody has about eight minutes to talk about um, their relationship in political economy with uh, Jonathan, let's put it like this. And I give the floor to Gary. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. It is true that, um, I don't know, I can't speak for everyone in the in the room, but I, I do know Jonathan for a very long time. And um, you know, I think we met in the 1980s. Um, he still had no hair. I don't go all the way back to the <laughs> earliest stages of Jonathan's formation, but I have tracked it for quite a long you time. You have to go pretty far back. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I think, uh, you know, Chuck goes further back. I, I actually never saw you with hair. I, but I am, you know, a lot of the remarks that were made in the initial panel, I think, um, are kind of uh, things that I, uh, you know, have observed and really valued always about Jonathan, the, the sort of generosity and the, the interest in um, in uh, you know such an enormous range of um, uh, substantive issues and his facility with uh, theory and his capacity analytically to um, you know parse out arguments and undermine things that you think just can't be undermined is is really just unbelievably uh, generative and it is it is often. Uh, intimidating, but it is uh, something that um, is ultimately incredibly rewarding as a as a colleague to um, <clears throat> uh, be able to experience. So, I was trying to figure out what um, in eight minutes I could do in a, a, a group of people who I really don't know and uh, in a, a thematic area that I am not actively working. What can I uh, usefully contribute? And I thought that I would. Um, you know, discuss a little bit the prehistory of uh, Jonathan uh, in uh, Amsterdam, just to give you a sense that there's um, way more continuity with um, uh, his past than uh, one, might, one might think. And um, I guess I, I, I just wanted to um, divide it into two kind of just bullet point types of uh, assertions about how to understand Jonathan's work. I, the other thing I wanted is just preliminarily, uh, and this is the kind of um, hyperbolic and maybe unnecessary, but um, uh, I wanted to say it anyway, because I think it's it, it, there's a lot of truth to this. If you think about um, a great collaborative intellectual relationships um, over the last 200 years, um, you know, you think of Marx and Engels, obviously, maybe Durkheim and most, uh, you know, there, there are in the 20th century, you know, Horkheimer and Adorno and, and maybe in political science, um, Lindblom and Dahl. But if you really want to contribute to adding to that list, I think if you think of uh, Sable and Zeitlin, they belong in any kind of, um, you know, list of, of great collaborative relationships, generative creating unbelievable citation counts, you know, uh, launching a billion dissertations and journal articles. And, you know, Jonathan is, uh, you know, very modest in his own, uh, <clears throat> in his own way, in his own strong and, you know, confident and uh, self-assertive way. He's very modest. And I think that, that, uh, you know, the if you look back, the contribution just as an empirical matter is, is really, um, you know, not challenged by many other uh, groupings in the last in the last century or so. So you know, that's that's I, I just thought you know you could argue about that. I mean, maybe we could have a discussion. About that. But I wanted to say that because I think it's true. Um, but the the two bullet point things I wanted to say one is just you know Jonathan's kind of 
general theoretical commitments that have existed uh, since the early days. And then I wanted to go through the, um, the sequence of projects that sort of helped him work out these sorts of um, theoretical con con uh, uh, commitments. And I went back and um, <clears throat> read some of these early articles from the 1970s and the 1980s and into to the 1990s that uh, Jonathan had written. And, and, you know, they're really, truly uh, remarkable, extremely strong, incisive, uh, and, you know, kind of exciting, informative articles to read. And, uh, you know, I think that one thing that is true about Jonathan today that was true about him even as a, a sort of dissertation student in, in England in the, in the 1970s is that he's, he's uh, remarkably capacious in the way in which he formulates and situates problems in in the sense both uh in terms of literatures he um he treats very seriously all of the literatures that deal with a particular kind of problem and he's able to sort of uh, put them in dialogue and highlight uh their their strengths but also uh underscore what their limitations are and he does that always in ways that creates an avenue for his own view to kind of come through and but also substantively um, John, and that would be in, in a, well, substantively, uh, Jonathan is uh, always uh, resolutely in a, a kind of taken for granted way, uh, comparative in everything that he's ever done. So he read, he, he studied labor history in, uh, in Britain and he, he worked on uh, you know, an incredibly narrow topic of uh, you know, the engineering industry and engineers and compositors and questions of adversarial bargaining and uh, <clears throat> cooperation and in Britain. And he, um, you know, he located that project in the local uh, 1970s British discussion and trade unions and in Marxism and in social theory. And, uh, but he also, um, from the very beginning, was concerned and aware of um, the parallel developments that were happening in uh, across Europe, in the United States, and Japan. He's always been resolutely uh, comparative, and that's been a, uh, an enormous uh, strength of his work right up to the, the present day. And then <clears throat> the other the other thing I think that was true then, and, and you know, it's part of an evolution, and uh, but it's a, an enormously distinctive uh, characteristic of Jonathan's work is. Uh, a, a kind of commitment to uh, relationality in uh, social theory. He's he's very uh, anti-structural, uh, anti-hierarchical, uh, uh, and also like if you think of the two most uh, you know uh, stable and uh, consistent enemies that Jonathan's had, so it's like Marxism on the one hand and neoclassical economics on the other hand. So he's not only, he, he's, he's, he's anti-structural, but he's not voluntarist. He, he, he's, he, he doesn't throw out these kinds of problems. He locates them in a set of um, relationships and dynamics that create the possibility for uh, you know, it, the, the language changes over time and the original formulations it was about, about strategic action and the capacity for choice and uh, you know it evolved into kind of questions of deliberation and interaction and it became you know experimentalism in its own way but this kind of <clears throat> commitment to relationality as a way to be able to kind of uh, continually generate and regenerate possibility for um, alternative formulations and alternative forms of practice is a is a is a consistent and ongoing aspect of his work. And then I would say, you know, another thing that um, you know very quickly, and perhaps not immediately, in the in the uh, you know, adversarial bargaining project, but certainly in the subsequent work that he began to do, he was very interested in these kinds of questions of governance, and in particular governance under conditions of uncertainty so that uh, it became extremely difficult to think of, um, you know, the hierarchical imposition of solutions from above or um, the um, capacity of a single class act or a, certain, a, a single position within the division of labor to be able to come up and impose its will on things. There's always a kind of uh, lack of um, uh, real uh, complete strategic information of all of the particular players and the um, need then therefore to sort of uh, create some form of 
uh, architecture for uh, interaction about how to proceed and how to make things work has been always a preoccupation that has had this sort of with governance under uncertainty. And then I think just finally forth uh, to you know um, reduce an unbelievably uh, broad and complex theoretical thinker to four four claims. I would say that there's a there's always been a very deep and uh, resolute uh, commitment to democracy in Jonathan's Jonathan's work and um, <clears throat> you know the uh, the idea that um, inclusion and uh, the the sort of uh, incorporation of voices into the um, deliberations about problems the more the better that that um, uh, hierarchy that uh, the imposition of some sort of uh, you know exogenously or externally um, decided uh, solution technocratically on what um, the experiencers of the problem have to um, uh, resolve is, is an ineffective and inefficient way to proceed in that. Uh, uh, the partic participation in decision making is uh, crucial. So I think those kinds of commitments have been with Jonathan um, really since since the very beginning. And then, you know, you can look at the sort of emergence of his um, uh, interest in experimentalism and experimentalist governance in the, in the EU and transnationalism in a very organic way from uh, you know the beginning, and he's really had, as as far as I can make out, he's had uh, well four projects, but the, the second project is extremely uh, broad. But the first project was about uh, thinking through um, uh, industrial relations in uh, in the um, late 1970s, early 1980s, and you know he was uh, concerned about um, adversarial bargaining and the way in which that was undermining capacity of uh, British manufacturers to be able to be competitive in uh, the international market. And so he was concerned about how could um, you know, what were the conditions under which uh, adversarialism emerged and also what were the conditions under which the possibility for cooperation could present itself. And there, the kind of, you know, mechanics of this relationality really under, under um, uh, deconstructing the sort of positions of all of the players, not only the labor players, the different factions within the unions, but also the, the employer players and the different factions within the, um, uh, the you know, the, on the capital side, created this sort of possibility for um, deliberation and strategic choice and the sort of uh, uh, inability of structural explanations to counter things. But then that gave rise to a second whole longstanding uh, uh, preoccupation, which I participated in, um, uh, this, this sort of alternatives to mass production kind of um, era of his uh, 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 scientific engagement, and there, you know, there was a preoccupation with industrial districts, a sort of whole preoccupation with multinational uh, corporations and how they uh, uh, govern themselves across boundaries, and then also uh, supply chains. And you know, there you had uh, again this kind of preoccupation with uh, problems of uncertainty. But I think it, it was in that kind of conversation where some of the things that Frank discussed in the in the in his presentation about the the development of uh, capacities and the importance of uh, knowledge infrastructures and the ability of um, you know uh, social systems to be able to kind of self recompose and uh, use learning as a mechanism for the uh, recomposition of their practices was a real preoccupation and it gave rise to this whole set of um, you know theoretical efforts to kind of think about how can, uh, you know, non-hierarchical, uh, but not totally bottom-up forms of organization govern themselves. And uh, then, you know, that gave rise to its whole uh, agenda about the welfare state. And, uh, you know, Anton and, and uh, Mauricio can talk more about that. But I think that they're the kind of um, concerns about how these sort of decentralized districts and their concern for capacity and skill and learning could be, um, you know, uh, applied to ways to rethink how the welfare state and wealth could be uh, uh, generated. And so, you know, all of that kind of uh, prehistory gave rise to 
I think a lot of the sorts of preoccupations and were sort of more theoretically perfected and made more precise uh, in the um, in his you know last twenty years of uh, work on the European Union and on experimentalist governments and uh, transnationalism. So I hope that was helpful. It's a big old hand, you know, Jonathan. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for this prehistory. I now give the floor to Anton. Yes, I mean, Jonathan, uh, I mean, as Gary already said, and everybody in this room is a, is a true kindred spirit. Um, and for me, I mean, there are a couple of things that really stand out very strongly and that I find extremely appealing uh, to, to his work, all of his work, but also the, the prehistory work, if you want. I mean, it's this notion that, you know, it's against determinism. History is contingent. There are path dependencies, but th this is there is no determinism in this, and I think that's 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 very strong. Then this idea of let's say let's call it the mutual constitution of actors and institutions. You've written about this, and in there the emphasis on uncertainty and uncertainty translates into reflexivity, and reflexivity feeds into or leads into feedback mechanism that need to be taken seriously institutionally. And that is throughout um, his, uh, his, his work. And then finally, a, a preference for in-depth case uh, research, whether it's at the European level or whether it's at the city of Utrecht, uh, which he really wrote a fantastic paper about uh, uh, recently. And perhaps more implicitly, but that has to do with this kind of contingent volunteer, volunteerism that is in his work, there's a commitment to, to democracy and, 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 and the public good. Now, I've gotten to know uh, Jonathan really well in the late 1990s and then the early 2000s when Maurizio and I were advising the Portuguese government and we came across the open method coordination. And when working for Frank van der Boeke, uh, writing uh, why, we knew, why we need a new welfare state and Frank sort of gave a, gave a, gave a good summary of, of that. What I would like to reflect upon is the following. I remember when I, I thought, I mean, why we need a new welfare state is, is one of my most cited words. And it's not my work. It's just as big Anderson, John Miles, and Duncan Kelly, he wrote it. So, uh, and, and of course, for, for Justa, it's not the most cited words, as, as we all uh, uh, know. And I felt extremely confident, probably overconfident. I think it was 2003 or something like that at the Center for European Studies at Harvard when I presented the gist of the argument. And I thought I had a wonderful PowerPoint presentation. And, uh, and, but then it was, you know, after having talked, it became very quiet. And then Peter Hall, Charlie Mayer, who else was there? Pepper Cool Pepper was there. They said, ah, come on, Anton. What you're talking about, you know, touches on 10% of the electorate. So, you know, maybe Frank van Boek is happy with that, but politically, this is simply not going to happen because, you know, it's also way too complex. The way you talk about the life course and invest in children, and when you invest in children that have rates of return on productivity and employment, and then it's easier to pay pensions later on. No, 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 that's not the way politics works. And this has haunted me ever since, this kind of, sort of denial of what we did and what I thought was brilliant. Mm -hmm. Also because, I mean, basically 10 years later, I wrote uh, uh, the book Changing uh, Welfare State and Jonathan helped me a lot uh, with reviews and giving me uh, 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 good ideas, is that basically the world had changed towards what we prophesized in 2002. So why is this happening if politically, it couldn't fly, according to the experts. I mean, Peter Hall, Charlie Mayer, I mean, we're talking very serious uh, 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 scholars. And it made me want to reflect on, so what, what, is, the, what is the translation here? What, what is going wrong in, in, in this, this, this kind of intellectual debate? And I kind of go back to Marshall in the 1950s. He has a beautiful definition of the welfare state. It's about equal social worth. 
It's about the ability to share to the full in the heritage of society. That's on the one hand. And then on the other hand, he makes this point that Trump made this morning, that fundamentally the breakthrough institutions is protection uh, against market forces, that you can, that you're being decommodified. And this kind of decommodification twist then takes Justa to develop his decommodification index. And subsequently, the whole political science literature reduces the complexity of the welfare state to this one dimension. And as Frank was saying this morning, when we think of the welfare state, yes, there is, there is minimum income guarantees, let's call it Robin Hood solidarity. Then there is you know, the mitigation of life course uh, insecurity, which is a, a, a social insurance function. So it's the piggy bank solidarity. And fundamentally, and this is also what Jonathan writes about and what, what, what Frank thinks about, is access to services. And in a post-industrial welfare state, these services become even more important. And I call it now stepping stone solidarity, by which I do not mean stepping stone upwards, but also sideward, sideways uh, through the through uh, 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 life course uh, transitions. And underneath that all is, is something, uh, uh, I mean, is the fundamental thing about stabilizing the economy as a, as a public good, irrespective of these other uh, three functions. So I'm still wondering why, what were we, or in the academic environment, why are we kind of misunderstood? And, and my sort of take on this is, 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 is more or less the following. If we look at the standing literature on, on the welfare state, and whether this is Pearson, Hausman, Krizi, Rueda, Busemeyer, Beccaro, Strake and Thielen, even I would say, the principal reform actors are always outside government. So they are political parties, they may be trade unions, they may be social blocs, whatever they are, but there's very little reflection on what happens inside the state. And I think this is something, I mean, there was a this discussion on bringing the state back in in the 1980s, but it never got anywhere, I guess. Then there is a second characteristic. It's, it's principally all about here and now redistribution. So back to decommodification, right? It's, it's really the politics is about, is the fight about who gets when, where, uh, and, and, and how much. Then in the political economy literature in particular, it's a lot about European integration, market making, globalization, skill bias change. That's all, you know, also what the economics write about. But there's very little reflection on the sociological change that has gone on in, in our society for the past 25 years. And the biggest change is, is the feminization of the labor market and the aging of the population. That's, that's poorly reflected on. So what, when we wrote, a new welfare state, we kind of said one the, the welfare state political debate is all about how many people are unemployed and what is the level of benefits. And there may be too many people, and the benefits are too high or too low. That's the that's the, the political discussion. But what we just said, John Miles, uh, Duncan Kelly, and, and myself said, that's the nominator of the equation of the welfare state. We should focus much more on the social policy consequences of the denominator, namely, what is the level of productivity for workers and how many people are being employed. And if there is good work-life balance, then you can employ uh, more people. If you have good childcare, which has a knock-on effect on education, you know, your average productivity in the long run probably, you know, goes up. So, um, so, so when when Strake and Thielen talk about conversion, which they really don't really get into so much because they like exhaustion and drift because these things can be reduced in complexity to redistribution. Whereas conversion, meaning you know you have a system but you use it for another goal, is intellectually very difficult to to fathom on the one hand and also to seriously. Uh, 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 study. Ah, okay, so I'll probably uh, stop soon now. So that and and then you know there's another and then the final sort of weakness in this 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 debate uh, I find is this sort of obsession. What okay, what's driving all this? Is it ideas, interests, 
uh, or institutions. And of course, we know from Max Weber and from Jonathan and from Hugh Hacklow and 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 Frank, you referred to it this morning as well. Now we have to think about the interaction effect between ideas, institutions, and interests. You know, these are elective affinities. At certain moments of time, they uh, 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 come together. So I'm still puzzled there. I, I wanted to say something more about my own research, but I'm not going to uh, do it. So, so, so let's put it to a question for the, for the debate. So why is every trunk in the discipline still looking under the lamppost to find his or her car keys? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so maybe why I don't drink. So I can okay. look somewhere else. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks, Jonathan, for allowing us all to uh, do something that you were not supposed to have, but we're doing it anyway in a more reasonable setting than the more traditional setting that one sometimes does in, in this country. Um, so I find this kind of preparation really hard to do because I, I would sit between these two versions, right? Because our, our great chair is asked to reflect on the work. And I just want to talk about you, right? And so we have most of that done. So I don't have to do that. And you've spoken about work, so I don't have to do that. So I've got nothing left. I've got no time, right? And you basically build, and we have Maurizio who wants to also go at least over time as much as his friends. So I'm going to find a way to do this in a, in a decent way. If I have only said 10% of what I wanted to say, we'll do that in the reception. So what I wanted to do is just to remind us that what Jonathan does really doesn't fit into boxes. So this box here is the political economy box, which makes it really hard for me to do because I think he fits in the empirical box, the theoretical box, the mentoring box, the contribute to the discipline box. And there's many more boxes that don't really fit the political economy box that I'm I signed up to, to say something about. But let me just say then a few things about where I got to know Jonathan. So my role in Canada was to set up the European Studies Program, which I did 25 years ago in, in uh, University of Victoria. And that was a time when the EU was heavily investing in European Integration Studies Institutes in lots of Anglo-Saxon countries. So US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. The rest of you really didn't notice this, other than that there were fancy conferences that some people went to, but it was a really big deal in North America. It boomed the field like you would not believe. And the field would not stick to these boundaries. It wouldn't be, oh, they, these are comparativists, those are political economy people, these are rat choicers, these are quads, quads, any form of divide up some field into some disciplinary echelon category, it wouldn't work. They would even have lawyers, historians, uh, economists, sociologists, in addition to, of course, very many political scientists. And Jonathan's work in Wisconsin was already mentioned before by, by somebody. That center was amongst the most active ones in all of the US. And my perspective coming from Canada was like, oh, where in Harvard are they doing great work? Yeah, it's so, so, as you said, it wasn't really EU strong, right? It was good comparative. And so it wasn't their EU center almost didn't get refund funded because they didn't do their job the way it was intended to be done. Same thing. You would go to California and think, oh, all the Berkeley's and Stanford's and so on are there, but they didn't really have outstanding EU centers. So it was a very interesting group of Californian universities, but it wasn't the big ones that you would expect, like Berkeley, Stanford, and all these other places, right? And then if you looked around, where was the activity? Wisconsin. That was one of the really active things. And why was it? Because Jonathan was doing his stuff, right? I'd never heard of him, but noticed, you know, he's in this new letter, he's doing that, and, that, and, that, and it was very active. And it's interesting that Jonathan decides where is the action? He moves to the University of, of Amsterdam and then starts that same dynamism here and blows it out of the water to have many centers, multidisciplinary activities with people coming and going. I studied at the University of Amsterdam. The amount of activity that Jonathan has managed to produce is way beyond what was traditional. I mean, there were a lot of people coming through Amsterdam, but what was done here in the last couple of years is really astounding. And so let me just then talk about what that means. It's not just flying conferences in, but it's building an academic community the way you would like that to be. And some people have already spoken to that, but it's it's about mentoring students. 
not just like undergraduates and grading their grades and, and being really tired at the end of it, but it's finding people with whom you can work and with whom you can bring those thoughts together and then give them the space to do their stuff, but also run with it, right? So that they themselves are able to become the scholar that he himself has become when he was being mentored. And I think that's a dimension that often gets underappreciated. And I think Jonathan profoundly believes that. He, he, he reads his students' work on time, sends it back, productive feedback, maybe a little bit too generous, as people have said, so that it's too productive. too productive. So people need to learn how to cope with the feedback so that it's not personal and it's all about trying to get you to better space. But he also knows when to let go, right? So when it, the person is not listening, he's like, mm -hmm. but okay, that's what they want to do with it. And then you move on. So I think that's an, a very important part of the contribution to the field, because there's all these little Jonathans now who have other names and identities and do their own thing. But they, they are part of that sort of legacy and bring forward their understanding of what it means to supervise, to support, to, to pay it forward and so on. So I think that's another dimension that I think is, is really important. So let me then uh, close the, I know Jonathan, it was fun to learn him about him as a scholar in the field and turn very briefly in the not remaining time to the work that I was privileged to do with Jonathan. So when I came to uh, NEOS in 2015, I was speaking, or 2014, 15, I was speaking to a few colleagues and they said, you used to have some time. Why don't you kind of hang around here? We can get you a bazooker, one of these EU, uh, one of these Netherlands grants that can stay on. But you'll have to have something to do. Don't you have anybody you know somewhere that can invite you? So I don't, I don't know that many people. So let me just see. Oh, Uva. Ah, the great guy there, Jonathan. I don't know him very well. So let me see what I can do. So I contact Jonathan. I said, hey, listen, is there any way, you know, I could be doing this bazooker's burst and then do something? So Jonathan, yeah, but then we have to do something. I said, I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so give a talk. That's not really doing anything. Uh, we can, yeah, yeah. So I've got this project that I've already had a whole conference about, and yeah, I, 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 I could share that. We could, we could do something. I go like, okay, what's it about? What's on there? Piece says, oh, it's great. I work on that too. Great. Okay, let's do something. Anyway, we spent. I, I just looked at my email before coming. An infinite amount of cooperation before he even agreed to the Zuber's verse because we'd have to really do something, right? So we planned, what are we going to publish? How are we going to do that? What kind of people? And he says, okay, that's doing something. So then I got invited and I had to talk to his two students, his PhD students, do a master's class, work on this conference, produce the, 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 the journal uh, special issue. And then also, of course, read all the papers and collectively decide who we invite. He had already a whole project, right? He had already had a whole workshop. He didn't need me at all, but it was, yeah, we do this, we do it well, and this is what we're going to do. Anyway, so I think I, I should stop. But that just gives you a bit of a flavor of what it means to work with Jonathan and his philosophy of really moving the field forward. So very much thank you, Jonathan, for all of what you've given us. Thanks very much. And now we move the screen, basically. Um, and Brian will double as technician. <laughs> Go ahead and start talking, uh, Maurizio, just to test if we can hear you OK. Yes, yes, here I am. Can you hear me? Can you uh, hear me? Yes, yes, but I'm trying to um, stabilize the computer so that you I can use the microphone because the microphone is important. Okay. Can okay. you hear me? Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. And can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, but we're going to get you in view so uh, people can see you a bit better. So bear with me one moment. Okay. Take, take, oops, not me. Oh, yeah, no, go take it away. Take it away. Okay. Can you hear me and you can see me? More or less. I did say speaker, but it didn't uh, pick him up. So, sorry, I'm still trying to see if there's another way to do this. Let's see. Put them on the air. Go there. There should be a button for uh, ad spotlight. Okay. There I am. Okay. Um, no. Well, no, it's not I, ideal, but it's better than it was. So yeah, I think you can remove the spotlight of ours. 
here to remove us. Remove Let's spotlight. Move there, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Here you go. So apologies for not being there with you. I really am sorry about this, but I am extremely pleased to participate at least online from, from Milan uh, to this event, which um, celebrates uh, the outstanding scholarship of a colleague and friend that I have known for uh, many years and uh, with whom I had the pleasure of um, collaborating through time in uh, countless initiatives on both sides of the Atlantic. Now, when uh, Teresa uh, invited us to focus on the intersections between our own research trajectories and in Jonathan's work, I, I really found myself in a condition of embarras de richesse, given the density uh, of and continuity of the flows of interaction between us over time. Um, and at the end, I decided to just focus on, on two particular moments, which I think are uh, uh, indicators of the influence uh, that um, Jonathan has exerted, has had on my, my own um, agenda and my own thinking. Um, the first one dates back to the late 90s, Jonathan, when we were at the European University Institute in Florence, uh, uh, both participating to the forum on the welfare state. And then in the final event of that seminar, perhaps Anton has this memory as well, yeah. you um, provided us, you gave us a, a, a very important intellectual gift for, for our research agenda the idea of recalibration as a summary concept to capture the then ongoing uh, shifts in um, the functional and also normative priorities of the European uh, welfare state. You just dropped the concept um, uh, during the discussion along with um, some very other, some other very interesting ideas about uh, hybridization, institutional hybridization, the importance uh, of governance structures, all you know, topics that um, you have uh, subsequently cultivated. I got very impressed by the notion of recalibration. And as, uh, as some of you may remember, um, we, I mean, Anton uh, Emmerich, uh, Martin Rhodes and myself, then uh, used this um, this concept uh, to structure uh, first a report for the Portuguese um, presidency of the European Union on the future of social Europe, which then became a book. And then you, you like the way in which we were uh, elaborating this, uh, this concept and you invited us to collaborate, to participate to another project that you were launching on governing work and welfare in Europe and the United States. You invited us several times to to Madison, and you, you also gave us, at least to me, um, you encouraged me to, uh, to develop a, a part which was relatively poorly uh, neglected in the way we had uh, outlined the concept of recalibration. And you said, look at the institutional recalibration, look at the governance structures, because there is, is where the action is. On the second, moment that I want to recollect uh, is the discussion that we had after the publication of my book on the boundaries of welfare. You were the editor of the socioeconomic uh, review and you were kind enough to organize a symposium on, on the book and you wrote a commentary to the book yourself. And there uh, you discussed uh, three scenarios uh, about the prospects uh, for social Europe that I had uh, briefly outlined at the end of my book. Uh, the first scenario was, was uh, uh, social 
I'm sorry, um, supranational social stalemate. So essentially, no, uh, no progress and, and the ensuing increasing functional strains. And then the second was a dramatic or dramatization of the first, namely not only, not only functional uh, strains, but also political strains, you know, uh, destructuring of, of national political uh, and institutional equilibria and a, the potential for uh, a, the break out of a, a backlash against, um, against the EU. And the third scenario was what I called incremental social supranationalism. And, um, you know, the first two scenarios were in line at the time with, uh, on the one hand, the, the, the Sharpian approach uh, based on the joint decision trap institutional asymmetry. And on the other hand, in line with uh, the pessimistic uh, expectations of somebody like uh, Stefano Bartolini and his Rocanian approach. And at the end of my book, I kind of uh, expressed a, a, an optimism regarding the third scenario. And I remember both uh, Fritz at another symposium and Stefano being very critical about this, uh, this optimism. He said, how can you be optimist after you wrote, you've written or you wrote you, uh, such, a, such a book? Um, but you took my side. It was actually in line that the third scenario was actually in line with what um, you were, you know, uh, at the time already uh, starting to, to research the, the, the um, grassroots, but also in institutional arenas, socialization of European integration. Now, of course, we all know what happened during 2009 and uh, the, the, the middle of uh, 2010, uh, a materialization of the, of the second dramatic scenario, this anti-European Union, uh, Eurosceptic and populist uh, backlash. But then development since the 2000 and in the middle of 2010, the, the, the poly crisis decade, as you have called it, I think vindicated the, the third scenario, the scenario of a, of a uh, gradual socialization of the, of the EU in its institutional architecture and of its uh, policies a process that you have yourself uh, extensively documented in your empirical research, but also uh, accounted for um, through your um, you know, theoretical uh, insights uh, and, and uh, theorizations on, on learning, on experimentalist uh, dynamics uh, uh, based on uh, actions and interactions. And I, I want to stress again, it's, it's already been done. Um, the, the emphasis that you have also play, always placed on you know, actors and their choices. Uh, I remember uh, you praised my, my, my 2005 book, but uh, I think that the, the, the real bit that you liked is just the last sentence of that book, where I say, where I say if structures do count, it is actors that ultimately decide. <laughs> uh, this was in line with your thought, and you encouraged me to forget about structures or you know, downplay my interest in structures and shift my interest to, to actors and, and actions. Now, um, the third scenario, the socialization of Europe scenario, uh, has not only advanced during the second, uh, um, yes, the second um, half of the 2010s, uh, but I think that what has happened, you will probably agree with me that what has happened during the pandemic uh, has gone perhaps even beyond our wildest dreams back in the, uh, in the second part of um, back 15 years ago. So let me conclude uh, with a question to you and to the audience. Can we now today remain optimist about the future of the European Union? I mean, optimist about the European Union moving in a direction which we consider normatively desirable, 
but also in line with our theoretical expectations. Uh, for my part, contra Gramsci, if you allow me, I think that we can remain today relatively optimistic about the intelligence of the institutions which we have created and the way in which they shape and reshape actors, ideal and material interested, interest. Instead, we cannot let our guard down about the will of actors, especially certain actors, uh, especially if we look at uh, the ongoing electoral campaigns in countries such as Sweden, or I'm afraid my own country, Italy. Thank you, Jonathan, for all your insights that you have you know, gifted to us. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Brian is fixing the screen. Um, let me give the floor to maybe the first person who would like to ask a question. I think we will do it in the same way as before. We first take some questions from the audience and then give the final word to Jonathan. Comments, questions? Comments from the panel to each other? So maybe to the PhD students, our master students, newly minted master students. Yes, Jeffrey, go ahead. I could ask a question, I suppose, about the reaction to the new welfare state idea that, that Spencer was talking about. Um, Sorry. I could ask a question about the um, new welfare state confrontation that Anton was talking about. I mean, I sort of thought that the reaction of your interlocutors was particularly narrow and not thinking about the size of the coalition. Um, all right, so there were turned out to be an awful lot more people who wanted day daycare, and we really know that an awful lot now after the after COVID. But so, I mean, to the extent to which we actually did manage to implement elements of the new welfare state, to what extent do you think sort of some kind of majoritarian or at least coalitional politics among those who vote, which is also an important qualification, actually led to and underpinned that? Or was it just something that was cooked up in, in, in Frank's kitchen? <laughs> I increasingly come to think of this uh, also in my, in my project uh, with uh, uh, with my ERC project uh, in, in terms of the following. I mean, lo and behold, over the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, what has been institutionalized is an intergenerational contract. We take it for granted that you know kids have free schools and free universities in some countries. And then there is a sort of an adult generation that has to pay for the free schools and has also pay for, for their parents. And so, th and that's a huge commitment and that commitment needs to be governed, that needs to be managed. And that implies, um, and of course we're living in a democracy. So, so politicians maybe like Frank will campaign and they campaign on the nominator they campaign by saying, you know, if you vote for me, you get more of this. If you vote for her, you get less of that. And that is still very relevant, but it's not the same thing as if you take that distributive logic with you once you enter government, because if you enter government, you know, 40% of GDP is already pre-committed. 75% of the public budget is about healthcare, education, and social security. So even though you want to tweak the small margins, you are responsible, not just for the fire brigade, but for the welfare state as it is. And that welfare state is very popular. So in a way, when Frank enters government after winning the elections, he shifts from, let's say, call it electoral responsiveness to an element of responsibility for the common pool, and the common pool is the, the, the is man-made, and that is the welfare state in this kind of intergenerational contract. 
And that's a completely different political game. But I would say, in, in, in answer to your question, that this is largely accepted by the larger public, that this is the way it is. And that's why I think it's wrong of you know my interlocutors at the time at, at, at CES to think that you know governing is the same as campaigning. It is not. And in all of, God, of, of Jonathan's work, he always opens up to other actors that play in the governance game, that come up with ideas that, you know, feed Frank, um, and this is the way it's being done. And then, you know, and then there's the next uh, election. If you only pamper your cleavages and you win the elections, you're probably going to lose the, the next election. And that's sort of inherent in this 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 governance of the of the common pool of, of what the welfare state is. So this is what I've come to think of it. I mean, you can take that to an extreme and say, okay, you know, parties don't matter, right? Because there is this this commitment, and whoever gets into government, this is going to be very interesting. It's going to happen to Italy right now because it's going to be, you know, pretty extreme right wing government. But Draghi has already negotiated the, 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 the resilience and recovery package. And, and, it's, and it's going to be very difficult for Maloney et al. to walk away from that. Now, that brings us to the electoral trouble, because, you know, how fragile is that, uh, uh, you know, in terms of a political strategy? But, but, but this is more or less the way I, I tend to see it. Thank you very much. If there are no questions, then I have. I just, Bridget, maybe you come just <laughs> front. So, uh, a question for Anton and also from Ritzo. For Anton, you, you, you talked about the need to bring the state back in, but maybe it, we should conceptualize it not as the state in the traditional sense, but rather public power and how public power is exercised at different levels. And then also how we get public capacity, because if the emphasis in your work and in Jonathan's work, the social investment is very much on services. It's a big part of your of your story. We know that that it, we know that uh, social protection is much. Payment systems are easier. It's an ATM. It's a yeah, payment yeah. system. Services is much more complex to calibrate services to needs and. I also think sometimes we don't think enough uh, about, and I don't mean the family in the traditional sense, I rather mean the household, that I don't think enough attention is paid because so much happens in, in terms of uh, youth and young people, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my, Maritza, I, uh, you were uh, cautiously optimistic, worried about actors, less so about the intelligence of institutions, so I think one institution, not that we should worry about, but we should observe very carefully over the next year is the ECB. Why do I say that? What is the ECB's tolerance for inflation? Because we know inflation is running way above the 2%, but we also know that if there's a knee jerk reaction in terms of interest rates, they can take the house down. So, in other words, how do we deal with a non-majoritarian institution that is extremely powerful, less tethered than any national central bank ever was to a political culture, et cetera, et cetera. So how, how will the ECB, um, I'm very glad Christine Lagarde is president, I must say. I can think of many people who'd be much worse. But how can the ECB handle what is a very tricky couple of years in terms of balancing inflation with the need to with with the needs of the European economy. Thank you. There, there was one question in the back, and then maybe you can just come to the front. Yeah, come up. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Bartan Herke. Um, a former PhD student of Jonathan, I don't have a question. I would just, um, also because we are in, in the room with different uh, little Jonathans as, as they've been called before. I'm one of them, I see David over there, Sophie is there, I, I, there's also Christos, many of you are not here, but who, who, I, who I stay in touch with and 
often when we meet, we never talk about our times with Jonathan and how great it was and how difficult it was and, and all that. So I just want to share how I got to meet uh, Jonathan. I think it was back in 2002. I was working then in the in Frank Van Broek's uh, cabinet as uh, European and international advisor. Uh, Jonathan wrote me an email. He wanted to see me for an interview because I knew, he knew that I was uh, Frank's advisor and Frank was busy back then as a minister of social affairs. And you came into um, my office, Jonathan, with um, uh, a Chuck Sable, I think, at the time. And I remember that Chuck uh, Sable was asking me questions. And I was staring at him. I didn't understand the questions. And then Jonathan acted as a sort of interpreter, <laughs> put them to me so that I could actually understand them. And then we had actually a very nice and interesting uh, conversation. And Chuck sent me an email not so long ago to remind me of that, that, that interesting conversation. So that was the first time I met uh, Jonathan. And then two, three years later, Frank Van uh, left the Belgian government. Jonathan knew that I was without a job, called me while I was on holidays in the mountains somewhere in Italy and offered me uh, a PhD, which was not on my agenda back then, but after a few reflection, uh, I think you gave me a day or something. <laughs> Generously, thank you, Jonathan. I said, yes, I started a PhD. Uh, which has been uh, quite a thrill, as also Anton, who was, of course, also one of my supervisors, uh, remembered. Um, I just want to tell you about my first year uh, paper. So after one year, we had to submit the first year paper. You remember, Anton, I was very confident back then. I had been Frank's advisor. I knew a bit about Europe. I thought that I had a good pen. We worked on some speeches together, Frank. So I was very confident that it would be all right. And then, first, we had a bit of a tough discussion about that paper with Anton. But then Jonathan came in on the revised version. He sent me something like seven or eight pages of comments. And they said, I think what you need to do now is start reading a bit more. And then came a battery of emails with I don't know how many tens or maybe hundreds of documents from the Social Protection Committee, the Employment Committee said, sit down, read all this, start again, and then we'll talk again uh, about your paper. <laughs> Just to confirm, you know, the thoroughness uh, well, uh, that I've also been able to, uh, to share. But um, I got through the paper, I finished the PhD. I have to say, I have to add here, and I think that's important because Amy referred to that. Um, my PhD trajectory also, Anton, you remember, has been a very difficult one. It took a very long time. And it's really Jonathan who uh, wouldn't um, let go of me. I think at some point uh, I might have dropped out for various reasons, doesn't matter. Jonathan is the one who kept coming back and saying, you are going to finish this, writing me emails, calling, what about the next conversation? What about, and I am eternal great, grateful for that, Jonathan. And with I, cum laude. With cum laude, yes, thank you for uh, reminding me. <laughs> so this has been quite a trip, uh, Jonathan. Um, we've worked together after that on the socialization of the European semester, similar rounds of review comments and uh, in-depth discussions. And it's really been uh, a thrill for me. And thank you for all that subject again. Thank you so much. On behalf of all the little Jonathan's. <laughs> I have to be strict also with the audio. Yeah, I said that I will give you back if there anybody else. Is there um, that? Okay. <laughs> so I, I think you also want to turn on the top line. What reception? What reception? Okay, okay, then Jonathan, thanks a lot. Well, I think I, I, mean, I can be relatively quick because I just really want to uh, acknowledge the, the wonderful things that have been said and uh, have been very important uh, to me, um, not only as friends, but also as uh, collaborators and in their own way, uh, also uh, often as uh, mentors. I mean, Narita talked about uh, ways I may have contributed to his intellectual uh, trajectory, but um, uh, in terms of the, the reconversion, my reconversion from being, let's say, a historian uh, with uh, comparative 
interests also running into the present to becoming a, a real, let's say, Europeanist, European Union scholar, and eventually uh, go, you know, governance uh, scholar. Um, the uh, European Forum on Recasting European Welfare States uh, in 1999, which I fell into um, coming as a, uh, a Jean Monnet uh, fellow for the first uh, half of the, uh, well, for the spring of 1999. That was really uh, critical for my intellectual uh, development. It was led by uh, Maurizio and uh, Martin Rhodes. Uh, Anton was a, uh, a leading light, and um, everybody I wanted to talk to uh, in Europe came through. Uh, I didn't have to travel at all. They all came to uh, to Florence, um, and uh, you know, it was really a very uh, rich experience, which I I continued to uh, to benefit from uh, to this day. Uh, Marisa mentioned um, the my off the cuff. Uh, invention of the the uh, the term uh, the concept recalibration, and um, so Paul Pearson was giving a kind of uh, uh, presentation of the uh, uh, his uh, introduction and conclusion to his his comparative book on the the new politics of the the welfare state, and he said, you know, I I don't like this concept of modernization, and. Um, I will offer a dinner to anybody who comes up with an alternative concept that uh, fits what um, what I'm talking about. I sort of looked at what he was saying, and I, I sort of raised my hand to like, how about recalibration? Indeed, uh, he did pick it up and use it. I'm still waiting for the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, uh, Maurizio and Anton also took it up and was very happy that they contributed a, uh, a chapter uh, to the, the book, uh, Governing Working Welfare, that I, uh, that I co-edited. I also want to, to mention, I mean, uh, Amy, thank you for mentioning the European Union Center at Wisconsin, uh, which was also very uh, instrumental in my, uh, my reconversion. So I probably would have been drawn from my comparative and contemporary interests uh, let's say employment and social policy and labor policy, uh, um, you know, comparing different European countries towards the European Union. But uh, actually being asked to be co-director of the European Union Center uh, accelerated that trajectory uh, dramatically. So it was in that sense, you know, the commission's investment in its European Union centers. Um, I'm seeing them in the middle of October. I'm going to quote you literally. I'll play back the video. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's, it was absolutely true. I mean, of course, it, it was a bit strange as somebody who had never worked on the European Union suddenly to become a union, European Union Center director. There, there were people who were much more junior, but in some ways better qualified to do it, like Mark Pollock, who was an assistant professor uh, at the time. But it, it had a, uh, a big uh, impact on me and, and one which I, uh, which I highly uh, value. Um, and I also very much appreciate the things that have been said about my general, let's say, methodological or, um, I don't know what you call it, philosophical or ontological uh, orientation and the um, the orientation towards uh, possibilism, uh, anti-determinism. I mean, I would be willing to call myself a, uh, a voluntarist. I always would say, and the the, uh, the quotation Maurizio uh, read for the last line of his book, I, I firmly uh, believe in. So uh, just as uh, Frank said, maybe it's better to err on the side of uh, too much moral hazard. I think you can also, it's better to err on the side of too much voluntarism, and too much space for the actors than on too much determinism because you know, if you don't try, you can't succeed. That's, uh, that's critical. And that's e equally critical for us as, um, as analysts, as uh, policy advisors or political actors in some. Uh, or, uh, or another. 
uh, maybe I just want to, uh, to to close with a with a couple of reactions, uh, both to what uh, Anton said about um, uh, the welfare state and what uh, Mauricio said uh, about uh, Europe. I mean, it's uh, on the uh, the welfare state. What is uh, is striking to me is that now we have people. There, I've just been looking at this two volume set on the world politics of social investment, almost 2000 pages, 52 chapters, uh, refreshingly anti-determinist yeah. and, uh, and open towards uh, reflexive action, but in the end, uh, totally reductive. So yeah. you have uh, you know, three types of, uh, uh, of social investment uh, welfare states, depending on uh, which, let's say, phase of the life course that they focus on, uh, creating, what is it, uh, preserving right. and mobilizing human capital. Yeah, uh, and then yeah. there are three distributional uh, patterns that they're uh, like the in inclusive, uh, segmented, or right. stratified, and, uh, and targeted. targeted yeah. yes. And then you have. Um, you know, coalitions uh, operating in, you know, different kinds of socio-political institutional context and the balance between them determines the, uh, the balance. So it, it, it kind of, uh, it hollows out the whole, uh, what's really of interest in the welfare state, which is, okay, you want to, uh, to make the, this is really, this comes to the point that Bridget uh, made, Okay, we think that uh, services are important, customized services. They are more difficult, definitely, to administer than pure transfer entitlement programs. And um, the question is, okay, how do you organize them? How do you uh, correct their problems? What is the, the whole governance system? Totally missing from all of this. And also, uh, Bruno Paglia, who's one of the co-editors of this, has a a, a, I mean, a quite interesting 400-page uh, co-authored book about reforming the French welfare state, uh, which has many nice ideas. But you know, he will then say, "Okay, well, we need training for these groups. It should do certain things." But how would you organize it? What what would a training system look like? It's completely missing. And so the focus on coalitional politics and distributional outcomes, um, you know, while it's the bread and butter of uh, comparative politics and political economy, also in some ways um, evades, overlooks, ignores the real problems of how do we make uh, social policies work to solve problems and benefit uh, people. And finally, on the um, uh, on the EU, I mean, I have been pretty uh, optimistic uh, about the EU. Mar Maurizio uh, mentioned that also, uh, you know, Bart and I identified the um, emerging truths in 2013, 2014 of the socialization of the European semester. Um, we faced rather a lot of uh, objections so that the reaction could not have been more skeptical, but gradually uh, the concept was taken up by the commission, by this, the social platform of European NGOs, and it became more and more difficult to uh, deny the tendencies that were, were being, uh, that were emerging. And when, once we had the, the Juncker Commission and its social AAA, and the pillar of social rights and uh, the changing content of the um, uh, uh, of the country specific recommendations and uh, we also had even uh, DG Ekfen, uh, I mean, uh, Moscovici and uh, Marco Buti talking about structural reforms 2.0 by this point it was really becoming difficult to miss the, uh, the tendency, and I think these did very much uh, prepare the ground for the reaction of COVID. So I, I am, I'm certainly, um, I, I like uh, Maritza, your reversal 
of, uh, of Gramsci. Um, I think that we have good reasons to be optimists of the intellect. I, I agree that there are some questions about uh, political will. Um, I want to just mention one more thing, and I will um, uh, develop it a little bit in my talk tomorrow, which is that I also, however, worry about uh, some of the, uh, the ways in which uh, some of the flagship EU policies responding to the, uh, the pandemic uh, have been designed. And um, I will have some things to say about um, the, the governance of the recovery and resilience uh, facility, which um, I will be studying with David Valkors and I, Francesca Forti, who is um, online also with Edgar so, uh, Imanis, who, who may not uh, be with us. But um, you know, the EU has a lot riding on it. And uh, from an experimentalist point of view, uh, it seems to be not a well-designed uh, program. I do worry about possible fallout uh, from uh, what happens when uh, circumstances change, uh, targets, milestones, goals have to be uh, revised. And the, the idea of a, a kind of rigid performance-based management, you know, um, no milestone, no money, um, proves very hard to implement. So but that's maybe we can talk a bit more about that tomorrow. Very much. I think this is the end of the first day of the conference. We continue tomorrow again, and there's also some drinks here right now. Yes, thank very much. Thanks a lot, all, for coming. It's been really a pleasure, and thank you very much for uh, the panelists here today and on screen. <laughs>